people who use the ecological approach are telling their students where to look, what to try to do. They're just not telling them how to do it. What's the most efficient possible victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight at Alpert. Hello, welcome to the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kwan. The Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. And today I'm back with the man, Greg Souders of Standard Jiu-Jitsu. Hey, Greg, how you doing? I'm doing good, Matt. How are you, man? Very good. Thank you very much. Great to have you on the show again. Um, obviously, every time, every time that you go onto a podcast, it picks up tons of views. So it's great for me to have you on my show. A lot of, obviously, you have a lot of support this uh, ecological uh, approach crowd very much into anything that you do. And um, I'm, I'm glad to have you back and have another conversation. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot of ecological stuff. If you haven't had enough of that, this is uh, <laughs> a, like, good, a good place to get your fill. I'm on the verge. And uh, you, you, you said that you wanted to, um, you wanted to have uh, a, a couple things that you had wanted to say about our last conversation and clear things up because you felt that you weren't clear, clear enough about your explanation. So, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, for sure, man. So, you know, as I, I've been doing the rounds of these podcasts over the last year and I've talked to many, many different people in many different ways, trying to share the approach and trying to teach people what I've discovered and trying to point people in the right directions. But just like everybody else, I, I've made some mistakes too. Uh, and so first is uh, one of the things that people always charge me with is, you know, my personality type, how I seem like an asshole, blah, 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 which is all true. I would never, you know, yeah, I, I'm a dick sometimes, an ass sometimes. And, you know, yeah, yay for the complexity of uh, the human condition. It's wonderful, right? But either way, I didn't want to come off wrong against you. I think last time I, I appeared a little bit frustrated on the podcast, which I do get frustrated sometimes. And I think it just does the whole conversation a disservice, especially when I'm speaking to you, because you're trying to engage in a way where you're trying to understand it and utilize it for yourself. So I definitely did a disservice to you and the people listening last time. So I'd like to try to make up for that to the best of my ability. Um, and then if I don't think you made it. I, I don't, I don't think it went that way. There were a bunch of people, of course, in the comments that were like, Oh, this guy, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and I'm like, well, yeah, that's why I'm talking to, uh, the expert on the topic. And that's why I'm trying to get clarification. And I even said at the beginning that I'm not an expert and it's, it's, uh, training pure ecological is not the the method that I've that I've used, and we even said, you know, um, that it takes time. It takes time to develop that that approach, and it's a lot just like anything, like learning any new skill. There's a lot of trial and error involved, and uh, you know, I think I think there's so many there's so many guys out there who want to criticize, and it's like, hey, I'm just I'm just like a white belt too, trying to learn. So that's why I'm that's why I'm having you on the show. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I'm I'm this kind of the same way. Like even though I've been at this stuff for about eight years, I like I, I make tons of mistakes, right? And most recently, I made a few, and I just want to correct that here to help those listeners and not make the same mistakes that I've been making. So. Again, I'm, I'm in no way ashamed about making mistakes or, or looking foolish because that's the process of learning. I mean, we all go through it. So right. um, so the first issue I just want to bring up is the contextual interference issue. So uh, I was using that word as a catch-all to describe the effect that variation has on the practitioner. And I was using it in, 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 improperly. I, I honestly thought it was a catch-all term. I didn't realize how closely it was linked to an information processing idea for how variation affects the learner. So I just, I was using that the, in the, uh, in an inappropriate way. Like I just wasn't using it properly. So, you know, the mechanism and we can talk about it later and I'd like to is the idea of repetition without repetition, because that's really what I was referring to when I was using the word contextual interference. Like I said, I just, I use that as a catch all term to describe the effect that variation has on the practitioner. So, uh, it was just wrong. And so, uh, I've stopped using it in the way that I was using it before. So I have a more clear understanding for how what do you call it now? Oh, no, it's just, it's just repetition without repetition. So the idea is that um, when an individual engages in practice and that we use variation within the practice, it has an effect on learning. Uh, and so the information processing crowd suggests that when you uh, work on a skill in one area and then you work on a skill in another area and you work on a skill in another area, that this context switching interferes with learning and it basically uh, helps you gain the ability to uh, transition from uh uh, skill uh, task to task and your skill will adjust accordingly. Uh, but that's not really uh, an ecologically sound explanation for what's actually happening. So instead, what's happening is we're basically facing many different problems um, 
and trying to come up with solutions to those problems. So we're repeating solving the problem and we're using variation to do that. So again, different problems and we're either trying to find similar or dissimilar or dissimilar solutions uh, to these multitude of problems or through these variable problems that we're facing. So it, it's, it's so the, two ways to kind of describe the yeah. same thing from two different uh, theoretical frameworks. And I was inappropriately mixing them together. Okay. How do you feel about the analogy that I used? Um, I think in the follow-up episode of our chat where I was saying, uh, you know, like I, I drum on the yeah. side. It's something, it's like a hobby for me. And my example where we're playing a song, but we're now, um, you know, my coach would get me to, play the same song but let's say i would play the hi-hat at a different frequency or i would play the kicker in a different frequency would you describe that as a repetition without repetition in terms of just building a skill in drumming i don't know enough about drumming to be very clear and i want to i want to be honest but i'm going to give you my perspective based on your your explanation so uh i have a friend of mine who plays music actually our camera guy he's a he's a musician as well uh and a better way i think to explain what you're trying to say would be playing something like a four, four. So like you would do it with your, just your right hand, right? You'd ba 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 ba, right? But then maybe do that same thing with your left hand, ba ba ba, or maybe do it in phase where you're doing it with both hands, but every second, every second beat you do it with your foot, you know? And so basically you're, yeah. you're, you're playing that same measure of time, but you're uh, alternating how you're doing it, right? So you yeah. can keep doing That's this. basically what I'm describing. Yeah. Okay, good. Cause I don't know. Look, again, what I just described to you is my limit of musical knowledge and understanding. So that's it right there. But I think if you, I think describing it to the learners that way or the, uh, the listeners that way might give a more clear picture of what repetition without repetition means. Mm -hmm. So can you give an example for uh, repetition without repetition? And let's say just an everyday class at standard jujitsu or uh, one of the games that you guys play? For sure. So we've been messing around with uh, understanding the effect of extension all week in the foundations class. So we looked at extension in variable ways, right? So um, they, in the case we looked at it this week, we looked at it in it as it relates to breaking an arm. So extending a bent arm into a straight arm from the arm lock breaking position. But then also looking at extension from a different way. So we started with chest to chest pins with double underhooks. And our main objective was to stay on top, hold our partner down while maintaining double underhooks. And then we uh, did a, a game where we started in the mount with double underhooks. And our uh, job was to transition to, excuse me, the arm lock breaking <laughs> position from double underhooks. And then we did a game where we started chest to chest half guard with double underhooks. And our job was to maintain double underhooks while we freed the trap leg. So as you can see, the, the similar feature between all of those things was is util, utilizing the effect of extension. So we try to use that to solve a problem in a varying degree of condition, right? So again, from the arm lock breaking position, uh, from the mounted position, and then from chest to chest half guard. So again, we were trying to solve a problem utilizing extension from different problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like, when you say the arm bar breaking position, you're talking about just like standard top yeah. oh, atomic yeah. position. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, so imagine reaching the arm lock breaking position from the mount. That's where I'm talking about. So one leg over the head, one leg over the body. Uh, my mm -hmm. defending player has connected hands and we were trying to extend the primary arm, the one we were attacking it to create breaking forces. <clears throat> okay. And, and from this position, like, are you still saying, or maybe I miss, uh, misheard you last time. Like, do you not show your students how to do that? Like, like different grip breaks. Right. Okay. My opponent is using a palm to palm grip to defend, or now my opponent is using a figure four grip to defend. Do you actually sit your class down and say, Hey guys, this is a, this is a grip break that I think is really, really effective for this particular situation. You could do it this way. Uh, and, and then you let them play or do you just say self-organize yourself? No, I don't say just self-organize and I don't say, here's how I do it. So instead I get, okay, my bad. I, di I didn't mean to be, um, I didn't, I didn't mean to be, uh, have a binary, uh, fallacy there. Go, go ahead and explain. Oh no. So like, okay. So we know that, um, if I want to break an arm, I've got to disconnect the primary arm from anything that it can connect to. Okay. So the problem with using like this, this option, this option, this option is it doesn't take into the account, the infinite variations that could arise. And I say infinite loosely. I'm just saying like sweaty hands, gi, gi grips. If you're training gi, uh, you know, 
other specific arm alignments, attaching to your leg instead of your arm. So what we do instead is we try to get them to focus on the invariant feature. So we're intending to separate the primary arm from anything that it's connected to any way that we can. So the reason we start off with that is because that gets the student to see that there is an invariant um, uh, property behind trying to make an arm vulnerable. And that's, again, separating from anything that it's connected to. So instead of trying to teach them this concept by getting them involved in breaking specific grips, we try to get them involved in experiencing breaking any grip. So, uh, and we can do that by having the bottom player actually start with varying connections. We could say, you know, bottom player start with your hands connected. Bottom player start wrist to wrist. Bottom player start with their, a, a rear strangle grip. Uh, bottom player start with your hand connected to one of your legs. I mean, we could do this so many different ways. Um, so again, it, we want them to solve the problem of separating connected hands or primary arm connected to anything that it can stay connected to. Okay. And so again, with all that, do you show your partner? Because I, I have particular grip breaks that I like for particular situations. I for find sure. them, they, I, I can consistently replicate them in, in a gi situation, in a no gi situation. Uh, if my opponent is relatively the same size and skill as me, I still find it consistently works. So for sure. would you ever take your student and say, hey, your opponent is, you know, using a figure four defense. And I think that this is the correct, I think that this is a solution that works. Mm -hmm. Or would you ever take someone and say, hey, um, you know, do, do you, how do I phrase this? Do you think you could shorten the time that it takes to acquire a skill by showing a quote, technique to break a grip? Well, it depends on your level of analy analysis for the word skill. What do you really mean by that? So the thing is, is I want to teach my the student. ability to break the grip. Well, that, that, so that's not really a skill. That's an outcome, right? So the skill itself is to organize yourself around a problem. And then while facing live resistance, uh, stabilize a solution that uh, solves that problem and then test how stable that solution is against varying degrees of grips or resistance or whatever situation you're in. So skill should be thought less of an outcome and more of a continuous process of solving problems in a specific way. So the idea is that we want to, if we were teaching students, one of the central problems around breaking an arm, one of those central problems is the primary connected to things that can defend it. So again, I don't want peace. I don't think teaching is having a student remember what I know. I think teaching is getting students to experience a problem and used all their critical faculties and their experience with that problem to solve it themselves. Now, having said that, this doesn't mean that I wouldn't share my perspective. So if a student was curious, hey, Coach Greg, how do you solve this problem here? Well, first, I would definitely make sure that I let them understand that the invariant features I'm separating hands no matter how you do it. But I would say, here's how I like to organize around solving this problem. And that could inspire them to try it that way, could inspire them to do things differently. But at the base of things, I want them to understand that the real problem or the real way of learning is not copying me, but learning how to solve the problem yourself right. based on what you're experiencing. So that's really the difference. I mean, I think the, the issue is like people are thinking there's this dichotomous relationship between techniques and games. No, it's like the issue is like mm. we don't – a lot of people say they teach, but they don't understand what teaching actually means. And so they're just supplanting copy me as a representation of teaching. Mm -hmm. So let's say the outcome would be, I mean, in this, th there are many outcomes in this situation. Like I think that even just separating the hands is an outcome. I think that lengthening the arm while still maintaining the position is an outcome for sure. And I think bringing the arm into, uh, the arm bar into completion through breaking is an outcome. So these are all sure. what we're essentially describing is like the phases of the arm bar, right? For the sure. the, as the defensive phases get deeper and deeper, right? So um, you're saying that you're not against taking your student and saying, hey, like, of, co of course we want them to be able to, uh, we don't want them to copy you and we want them to be able to address the arm bar as certain variables come up. That's all true. But like there's... Um, there's certain arm bar grip breaking strategies, I think, that are, for the most part, pretty reliable. For so sure. are, do you show your students those particular 
I don't want to call them tricks, but like concepts or say, Hey, like one concept I love is if my partner is locking their hands and let's say like a fig, uh, a palm to palm or an S grip or wrist to wrist. Okay. Uh, don't lean back on straight lines because now your partner's arm is pretty strong when you're pulling their elbow back straight. However, if you can anchor the elbow to the hip so that they can't hitchhike while at the same time attacking the wrist and creating this sort of uh, external rotation movement, now you're working against the rotator cuffs. And now when we're leaning back as the the, the forearm goes across the hip, now it, it's very, very difficult for them to maintain this gripping position because you're not falling back on a straight line. So that would be a concept that I would teach in terms of breaking the wrist grips in the arm bar for, for just for an example, like, would you, would you say, Hey guys, I think that this is a concept or this is an approach to this grip that really, uh, I think is effective. Well, I'm sort of confused by how you frame that whole thing. So do you, you, I'm just, I'm again, I'm not being unnecessarily challenging. I'm just really trying to communicate clearly here. Um, you use the word concept. You can be challenging, bro. Oh. That's why you're here. No, I, I mean, I mean, be. I just want to honestly, dude, I want to be clear. I, again, I'm not here to be like, yeah, motherfucker, you don't know anything. But <laughs> no, I mean, like, so you use the word concept, but then you went to describe a very specific sequence of events. Those are dichotomous things. A concept is a general idea. Right. Okay, okay, okay. So, so the concept would be separate. don't fall back on straight lines when the arm is uh, when the arm is locked straight. Don't pull in the same direction as the forearm. Make the forearm go. Uh, make it go perpendicular to the, to the angle of breaking, I guess, so okay. that you're working against this. So you're creating that rotation in the shoulder. That would be the concept. Try to get the forearm to run in a perpendicular angle instead of running straight back. And in that way, it's very difficult to maintain the grip, I guess would be the c concept. Well, it's still not a concept yet. I mean, again, we, we, a concept is a general idea. It's non-specific. So what you're saying is specific. And so it's not conceptual, right? Um, so I guess the concept here would be how does the angle of uh, force application affect the connectability of the hands? So we would first have to try to come up with a way to describe that. And then that would be the concept. So I heard three different things there. So first you did, you noted a problem. If hands are connected in the way you're describing, what you're showing is see the arms are bent, right? So if I start pulling at the elbow straight to me as you're describing it, I'm not actually affecting the area between the elbow and wrist. So it's going to be much less efficient at separating hands because I'm not pulling on what's connected. I'm pulling on a part of the body that almost has nothing to do with the connection almost because there's still relevance there at the elbow, right? Keeping the elbow attached to us keeps our hips closer to their shoulder. Okay. And by doing so, we can use that, that concept of closeness by focusing our attention on keeping the elbow connected to us to make it to control the situation longer so we can take our time to separate the hands in different ways. So the concept here would, I guess, would be that, uh, by separating the hands, uh, we, we want to bring it in multiple directions, not just one, right? So we don't want to use straight, straight lines is also a, a weird thing. Cause what do we mean by straight lines? Cause every line between one point and another is straight, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess what I mean by straight is relative to our opponent's shoulder line. Right. Along the same right. line, like along you, the same like you, line when as the I, shoulder. You, yeah. Like not, not falling to, to your side, but falling straight back, I guess is how I would describe that. Right. So I think about it, think about how, and I'm again, think about how inefficient that would be. Like, think about what you just described to me, trying to describe that to a student who's never done it. That's so much external information that now the student is trying to like, what the fuck does Matt mean? Like, what does he want me to do? But think about it this way. If I just put a student in that situation and I gave them three simple tasks, hold your partner down any way you can with your legs, keep their elbow glued to you and try to separate your partner's hands any way that you can. Think about how much more efficient that is because it allows a student to try to perform that action while coordinating their whole body around the thing they're attuning their intention to and then they're experiencing it for themselves against live resistance. You'll get people separating hands within a few minutes. And then we can put them in a live game and put them there. And they'll, they'll do it against a, lot, a bunch of people that same day of learning it, which is interesting. So it's very efficient. Oh, true, true. So let's take that same student who has never done it before. Um, and we ask them to control the Juji Yatame as long as they can, separate the hands, um, whatever, maintain the position and create the arm extension. But like, 
if you take a beginner and do that, I, I always see the same reactions, whether it's beginners or kids. Right. You always get them pulling hard back. For sure. You, sometimes you'll see them lean back without separating the hands. Uh, a lot of the time you'll see them using the the torso leg and the cross face leg and removing them from yeah. the, uh, the body and the head and kicking away at the arm, which kind of loses all their control. So don't you think that a student, you know, if you, if you just give them the, the directions, okay, control the position, break the clasp of the hands, create limb extension, right? Like, or let's say those are the constraints you're working with. Um, do, if you keep seeing the same mistakes re reoccur and you're not seeing them solve the problem that they're trying to solve, in my opinion, and it's not just like, um, I think it's a lot of people's opinion, but also not just what I think would work, but what I've seen work in class is if I now show them, okay, I believe that this is not the best way or it's not the only way, but it's an efficient way, even against someone who's bigger than you to break the grip and to make it work uh, and to separate the hands and whatnot. So like, could you not accelerate their ability to complete the task by giving them that piece of information? Maybe, maybe not. We, there's a Especially lot. Especially when they keep fucking up the same, well, as, the same way. I, you're saying, I think you're saying a lot of things there. So let's try to break them all down because they, they all don't follow. So let's think about this. Okay. So you say you want to speed up your students learning and you want them to solve problems faster. Yet you haven't let them experience a problem yet. So the first thing you said was actually great. You're absolutely right. When students first try to do something, they do all kinds of weird shit because they don't know what the hell's going on. Right. So no matter what you tell them, I, you could describe the arm lock perfectly and you're still going to get students kicking at the arm. You're still going to get students pulling at the elbow because again, your information has nothing to do with what they're experiencing. That's your information. The information they need to self-organize around is present in the environment. So our goal is to get them to attune to that information. So that's what, that's what our words should do. Our words should give them not only an intention, but it should focus their attention on specifying information. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do with our language, right? Because that's efficient. Okay, now let's go back to the way you described the work things. Imagine this. How does telling your partner uh, which specific grip break to use teach them how to stay close to the shoulder? How does that teaching that grip break teach them to hold the head down? How does teaching that grip break teach them to keep their body leg closer to the head leg than not? How does telling them to do that grip break teach them which angle they need to move their body to hold the head down more effectively? I think you're, but I, th I believe you're describing two different things because I'm talking about a grip break and you're talking about controlling the actual position. Okay, freeze right there. Freeze I right look there. at those as two separate but they, tasks. But they aren't. That's the problem. So you're doing what's called decoupling. You're using a reductionist view of why things happen to describe why things happen. And this is actually the problem that the ecological approach is trying to solve in all sport, right? So the traditional model tries to take what they call practice tasks and separate them from the performance environment. And that's causing this strange issue where uh, we're, we're not taking all the constraints into account to uh, let the task organize our movement. So what, you, what these uh, traditionalists are assuming is that you can take a piece of something, train it by itself. And then when you go back to the performance environment, you'll just all of a sudden, it'll plug itself in. But this is actually, this doesn't happen. So what I'm saying is you have to learn all those things together because they're all relative to each other. So the grip break we use is relative to where our legs are relative to our opponent's resistance, uh, relative to the overall objective, which is holding them still and holding them down. So if we don't allow the skill to organize under all the constraints that are present in a given moment. We're not actually teaching them how to do what we say we're teaching them how to do. Okay. So are you saying that the task of controlling the Jujigatame position and the task of unlocking the hands are actually the same? Correct. They're related to one another. So I guess where I'm, I, I'm differentiating this in a, in a mechanical sense is that one task is, is done with your arms and one task is done with your legs. Hmm. So it would be like, let's hold on a sec. Let me finish. Let's yeah. say, let's say it was like a heel hook situation. So your leg's job is to create wedges and isolate the knee and the hip and, and, and the upper part of the leg so that we can generate breaking pressure. The bottom, the bottom part of the leg is controlled with your upper body. And so that's, I think, where I'm differentiating. Maybe because part of your body is, is sort of doing one task, the other part of the body is doing another task. However, they do, uh, 
they do come together and try to complete a task in unison, which would be control leading to the braking mechanics, right? Sure. So yes, the, t the problem to be solved is we're trying to get the submission. We're trying to create enough braking pressure to finish the, the match, whatever. Right. But one, of, one part of my body is doing one task. The other part of my body is doing the other task. So could I not give clarification to said student by by describing what what each part of my body is trying to do to uh, to create the solution, not in the way you're describing it, or no. is that just not effective in your opinion? Well, well, both because what you're doing is you're doing that you're actually falling into the same trap that the the researchers did when they first tried to describe how behavior emerges in an information processing model. Okay, so you're thinking it's like a muscular problem or like a neurologic neuromuscular problem where you have to train your muscles to do one thing and train your muscles to do another and then you can put them together magically and they just do the thing that you intend them to do. But it's not a neuromuscular problem. It's a task orientation problem. Because everything that our Right, but I don't I I, yeah, I don't I I don't I don't agree with the first part. I don't think it's a I wouldn't say that I think it's a muscular problem. I do think it's a it is a task that, that you you know, I'm not, I, of course there's different ways you could wedge a leg when you're in an ashigarami, but the, the, I think instead of that, what I'm really more describing is like the task of not right. losing the knee line, the me, task yeah. of creating the heel exposure. Right. Those. Okay. So all those things are done. So your legs affect what your hips do. Your hips affect what your arms do. Your arms affect what your shoulders do and your, your whole body affects itself. And what your opponent's doing affects all those things simultaneously at all times, continuously. So the thing that you're trying to parse out, you can't really parse out. You can't separate it. So my legs will always change what they're doing as my partner changes what they're doing. And as my partner changes what they're doing, as my legs change what they're doing, my arms change what they're doing. So it's, there's so many degrees of freedom that are present in a given moment that we can't freeze them and isolate them and decompose them into their component parts because they all are relative to one another. This, this has been, this was proven a hundred years ago. This isn't even in question anymore. Uh, it, it's not even a thing. Uh, but the, again, since, since the modern coach and the modern jitsu aficionado or whatever is not up to date in their scientific understanding, they, they're saying things like that people believed in 1905. Um, so, and again, again, this is the reason why the ecological approach is so necessary, but either way. So yeah, so no, you can't separate them. So what the, the thing is this. You, you put someone in a situation you want them to understand. So in your case, the hook, we know that the body orients itself in different ways to perform different functions within that given system, but that given system can't be separated out into component parts. We can change our task focus to try to focus our attention better in one area or another to enhance the behavior that's coming out or to um, highlight uh, areas of attention that need it so that we can become more efficient in performing the task. But this is a continuous and ongoing process. The, the effect of training is not stored in our mind as I have this skill now. What's happening is uh, we're making our perception more sensitive to the information that's going on, and we're coordinating action patterns or stabilizing movement solutions to help solve this problem in real time, every day, every time we try. So we have to keep that system coupled and together so it can do its job. <clears throat> yeah, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Um, you're just again, disagreeing on the methodology. Mike I don't even know if I disagree on the methodology because I am a fan of the ecological approach. Like I said, I, uh, you know, my, I put it, I put my students through it for like a good solid three months. Um, I know maybe that's not even enough time to, to really get the full feel of it, maybe in your opinion, but like three months is a long time when every day you're playing games, like every single day, you know, like I, I wasn't showing any techniques. I, I was saying like, okay, you know, when we're playing this game, these are some things that might come up and these are the, these are some, um, task focuses that you could you could use during the games okay um so i like i like the ecological approach and in terms of being able to problem solve and being able to build that uh to acquire that to acquire skills and find solutions i'm for it i think it's good however where where i'm sort of i guess disagreeing is i'm wondering how do we know that pure ecological approach training is better than showing techniques and ecological approach training where there's a balance of, okay, I'm going to now show the student techniques. We're going to describe mechanics and, and uh, situational strategies and things like that or, or concepts plus ecological training. So I, I, th I think that that's, how do we state. know that just ecological training? They're, they're, you're Sorry? just, 
you know, I think that's, that's the mistake. You're saying something that I'm not saying. So neither are the scientists either. So this, I don't know, this is difficult. <clears throat> First of all, there is no techniques. There are no techniques, okay, uh, in, in this way that people are saying there are. Okay, someone is saying there is a, a technique for an arm lock. There is a technique as a sweep. There are infinite amounts of them. Technique is right. just, it's just the I way. Agree. Okay. So, so we can't, we can't teach how to solve a problem by giving our student the solution that doesn't work. Like this is not even, this is not debated anymore. This is like, like science is so far past that. So the issue is, is these old ways of thinking are sticking around because they sound good because they, people, people have no experience with what it actually is. Right. I mean, this, I mean, the, so we're not just, it's not a dichotomy between should we use just the ecological approach or should we teach technique? The thing is, is the idea of teaching technique is dichotomous to the approach, but giving informational constraints that help your students focus their intention and attention is not. We use that. We, the, people who use the ecological approach are telling their students where to look, what to try to do. They're just not telling them how to do it. Do you know what I mean? So I'm saying, so I'm saying like, so, so here's the thing. I, I think you saying that there's no such thing as a technique that is, I think that falls in line a lot with how you teach and how you, you perceive jujitsu. Right. I think a lot of people would disagree with that and say, well, you can show techniques, whether or not it's effective is another thing, but like I can show my student Here's an inside heel hook. Is this the only way the inside heel hook will work? No, because there's going to be, like you said, infinite variables that come up. They, maybe they hide their heel. Maybe they're a little bit slippery. Maybe their their leg is much longer than mine. Maybe it's shorter than mine, et cetera, et cetera. So there's so many variables that could come up. But I could show a heel hook and say, okay, this is an inside heel hook from the saddle. This is how, This is one way to do it of the infinite ways. And I'm saying... And I'm not saying this is the only way that's, that you can do it. I'm not saying that this is the best way or whatever, or that nothing, that there's no way to counter it, but this is a technique Let to me. say that it's not a technique, I think is, uh, I think, I think we're coming down into like, uh, disagreeing on what language is. No, and, no, no, no. And well, that's important. The, how we use the word. Because language is, is symbolic of what we're, how it's happening. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make our language as clarifying as possible so we can describe as as closely reality is that we perceive it because again, it's a difficult thing to do. So when I say there are no techniques, what I'm saying is you can't show me anything. Like that's just, that's not what's actually happening at the level of the brain and body and the embodied nature of the whole process. Again, because not even you do the same thing the way you're saying it. So if, if you don't reproduce the same movement pattern twice, why do you think that you showing me it's going to make me do it? So here, let me read you something. Okay, this is not Greg Souter saying this. Okay, to understand, this is <laughs> it's, it's intense scientists. Okay, this is this paper is written in 2022. All right, so despite over 40 years of research by motor control scientists, attempts to update cognitive approaches through embodiment embeddedness, when it comes to enhancing skill in learners, coaches over the past decades continue to focus on stabilizing internalized models of sport techniques so they are repeatable and automatic, and they hold up under stress. To achieve this goal, the coaches devise drills that are often isolated and reductionist with the belief that the rate of skill learning is suppressed under competitive pressures, which may distract attention and narrow, narrow, me, me, excuse me, memorizing. So again, this is, we're, we're trying to use an old model of interaction. Okay. We are thinking that by having people rehearse what we think is happening over and over and over and over again, that this is going to somehow uh, induce learning. This is not actually what's going on. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find it. They, they, they were talking about how. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I still think, OK, you need to put it in a live situation, too. I still think that um, building games or, you know, as, as, uh, uh, a lot of your critics say, oh, this is just target sparring, right? Like whatever you want to call it, target sparring, yeah. building games around it, whatever kind of use, whatever kind of constraints you want, put using against live resistance, right. And really like 
uh, seeing predictable reactions and things like that and trying to solve the problem and get to the eventual sol solution. Sure. I think that the ecological approach is great when it comes time to actually develop that skill so that it can work under different variations. But I do think that part of the learning process or uh, the part of the learning process can be accelerated by showing certain sh showing <clears throat> certain concepts or okay. certain ideas or certain techniques. Okay, freeze. I, I, I want I want I want to highlight this thing you say. You're saying you're saying I think that we can more efficiently yeah. do something. Blah 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 blah. Right? Yeah. Why do you, why from, why is just it, from my own experience of okay, teaching? Just in, from my in, own experiences. And what if, we, if we're trying to understand objective facts about reality? Whose opinion has more strength than another if we're basing it on our own personal experiences? Well, so who, who, good question. Are you saying for me to, well, what are you saying? What well, are you I'm saying, saying for me to? The entire scientific enterprise is built to defeat this because it is, it is unreliable way to tease out and describe the natural phenomena we all experience. So what we do is we have a method of discovery through uh, falsification, through collecting evidence and arguing the topic, right? So, but, but what, like, listen to what you're saying. You're, you're saying that your experience of what you think is happening is stronger than the collected data of people who are trained to not only define this problem, but to tease out what it actually is. But do those people teach jujitsu for a living or do they know jujitsu? It's not a jujitsu thing. It's a teaching thing, right? They want people to learn how to learn. So what they're trying to understand is how does an individual go about creating new behaviors. Jiu-jitsu is a behavior. And so this entire scientific field is trying to uncover how this actually happens on a person-to-person on a, a -person level, regardless of what the behavior is. And so what you're saying is that your experience as a jiu-jitsu coach, because it's special, it's called jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. supersedes all of their training and research and understand these motherfuckers debate when they, when they get involved with one another, the shit goes hard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, but, but I'm not, but I'm not saying that, that the ecological approach or that that science isn't as good. I'm not saying that it's not valid. I'm not saying it's not effective. I'm not even saying that it's the best way to acquire skills. I, I'm not saying you're saying what I'm saying is okay. when you make a statement, I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead. When you make the statement, when you say something, I think teaching techniques improves learning, you're making a statement about reality. So there is there are people who study the reality that you're naming, and they're saying the way that Matt Kwan is describing it is not factual and not aligned with what we've discovered. Because you're not just saying what you feel, because someone felt like you too. And when they put that to scrutiny, they were proven wrong. So... Well, I do. I am saying I think. Yes, it is my perception. Um, and I can hear all all of your fans right now just and fuck my their fans, minds man. are just exploding, no. and they're just they're just creaming all over their themselves. But uh, I, I, my, my thing is, how do we know that just purely ecological is better than a mixture of ecological plus? Uh, techniques? And I say it. Be I think because I've witnessed, like numerous times when you watch a student try to solve a problem, you watch them try to complete a task and you try to, to uh, you try to give them and even through the ecological approach, try to give them games that can build certain skills, but they're still running into the same problems. They're repeating the same problems, yeah. but I've seen it in situations where I say, okay, I'm just going to show you something that works for me. This is a solution that I've used I can repeat it multiple times in a live situation. Then they use it and I see them use it in a live situation immediately. So how is that not accelerating the acquisition of a skill or the ability to complete a task? Because you think that the outcome you're getting them to perform in that moment is going to transfer to all other situations that are like it or require that level of solution. No, I don't think that. I don't think that. Then what problem I think, are you solving? I think that 
Well, I think that I'm giving them a sense of direction That's towards what, the solution. Freeze. I don't Good. I don't believe that I'm that this that this solution works under every situation. Perfect. I don't think that. Perfect. So then this is what why the ecological approach is better because what it is saying is that solutions will emerge, but they will never be repeated again. Right? But what will be repeated is our ability to focus our intention and attention and tune to attuned to, excuse me, a spec specifying information that will allow us, allow us to self-organize and create a stable movement solution that when facing uh, and working against enough variability in the face of novelty will become adaptable and flexible so that we will be able to, or this skill will not be perturbed e easily by changes in the environment and we'll be able to continue to use this stable solution in increasing against cre increasing levels of novelty. So we've solved that problem that you're trying to solve. So I'm trying to make good students too. Like you guys are thinking that I'm trying to make my students reinvent the fucking wheel. Can you imagine? Why would I go backwards? I'm a serious guy. I've given up my entire life for jujitsu, literally everything. And my sole purpose, as I put my two feet on the ground every day, is to make people as good at jujitsu as I possibly can. Why would you think I would choose a more efficient way? And these problems that you guys are having, I'm not having in my room. It's, it's just strange, you know? And so I, I don't... What problems? Like when you say like, you know, I, I, I give my students this and they, they do this anyway, they do this anyway, they do this anyway. I don't have those problems. Like the things that you have to correct, I don't have to correct for because the approach itself is, is very self-organizing. It, it, it corrects the things that are difficult to correct, correct through explicit instruction. And so... I'm creating skill at a faster rate and not just a singular skill, but a variety of skill. And it's like, no matter how much I show it or how much I invite people to come try it for free and how my white and blue belts beat up brown and black belts, nobody believes me. And it's like, dang, man, this fucking sucks. And no matter how, how well read I am or how well I try to point you guys in the right direction to read what scientists are saying, everyone thinks it's just me. And I'm like, dang, man, this sucks. Because again, people have been- I mean, I don't believe that because I've spoken to you for hours and hours and I, I don't believe that. I know a lot of people are quick to judge. And of course, because everyone has a platform now, you can just leave a comment and you can instantly hear everyone's opinion. So I, those opinions are not mine. I have a full open mind and I, I'm not, um, you know, I, I know how skilled your room is and I know how skilled your students are, even your junior students. So I'm, I'm again, I'm on, I love the ecological approach. I just have uh, seen with my own eyes on countless occasions where a student repeats, uh, you know, the same problems in live situations, even after we've used the ecological approach and put that situation under duress many, many times. And then I say, OK, I'm noticing this is the problem. Try doing something like this. And then immediately they adopt that piece of advice or that concept and they make noticeable gains for they sure. Make, they they're now able to. So like, how is that not effective? If so, that is, re, if that is helping them reach a solution, it, it's a, <clears throat> you're getting a false positive. So your ability to describe something explicitly to your students solves that momentary problem. And you're good at doing that because you've probably been doing it since you started teaching. Right. But since you've only been using the ecological approach for three months or four or six months now, because it's been a while, your efficient usage of not only the methods, but your understanding of the science and why you're choosing these message, me methods is not up to par, right? So it's like saying, it's like, remember when white belts say, coach, you show me this arm lock, but it doesn't work for me. And, and, and the coach is like, yeah, because you're a white belt. It's just, that's the same thing that's happening right now. You're like, man, I can't use the ecological approach to solve these problems, but I can with explicit instruction. Well, yeah, because you don't know how to use the ecological approach yet. And that's totally fine. Like you're just starting and it's going to be very difficult because it's not an easy thing to do because now you have to shift your whole paradigm. You have to be like, okay, how do I use mo a model of self-organization through the focus of intention and attention to help my students acquire skill by using language that I haven't developed yet? That's fucking hard, man. It took me eight years. It took me eight years. And I could easily describe something to you. I could easily show you a move. But again, I would only be solving that momentary problem. I wouldn't truly be teaching my students anything. I would just be giving them a, a sound bite to remember. <clears throat> where is the... Where is the proof that pure ecological is better than ecological plus a, a, a plus some of the older uh, older methods of teaching okay. where it's techniques as well? For sure. Let's stop right there. So first of all, um, you can't mix them. 
they're not mixable things. Like people keep saying this. Mean? Okay, so I, I've described this before. The ecological approach is a theoretical framework that describes how uh, an, an organism interacting with tasks in environments produces behavior based on the uh, concept of direct perception. And so the information that an individual uses to perform tasks in an environment is uh, in the environment. It is a embedded relationship between the, the actor and the thing that it's acting within. It, it's, it's like they interact with each other to produce behavior. Uh, it's not something that the organism is storing in their mind and then revisiting later. Uh, so when you show a technique, what you, what you think, what you're doing is the opposite of that. You're saying here is indirect information. Here is information that I'm going to tell you that you're going to store in your head and you're going to use that to produce behavior. Those are two different, uh, theoretical frameworks. They don't, they don't combine, right? Because you're assuming that the brain stores that and uses it to produce behavior. You're just assuming that. The ecological approach is showing that it's the interaction of the actor and the environment. There's a relationship there that that basically affords a certain level of communication that is the foundation for producing this behavior. They're two different things. Okay, I'll 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 rephrase the question then. Where's the proof that pure ecological training or let's say games, I don't even know. It's not games. Right. I, 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 and, but you know what I mean by that? You know what I mean, right? You, you talk about games, you, the way that you teach classes, you develop constraint based, uh, <laughs> t- positional sparring. <laughs> no, no, like no, you, wait, wait, wait. You ha- you wait, create- it's situational sparring with constraints. Let's call it that. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so where is the proof that training, that teaching jujitsu is more effective purely just using that than, using that for part of the class, but also using techniques or, sh- or showing, sh- I don't know what you want to call it, showing moves, showing <laughs> concepts, showing situations and, and how you can reach solutions, right? Show spoon feeding in for whatever you want to call it. Where's the proof that that is not as good as pure ecological. Okay. I, again, I, this is very hard because again, you're setting up a situation that doesn't actually exist, but so I'm gonna, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna work within it, and I'm gonna try. Well, it exists in my room. I mean, we I, no, I we no. do situational with constraints, and we do techniques. Is that no. not is that not what I'm describing? No, I, I'm not saying it doesn't exist as as you create it. What I'm saying is, uh, these are. I don't know how to. That that's not a real thing. Like, you can't say like, the, a human learns this way. And so we're going to, we're going to align our practice to stay in accordance with what we know about the way people learn. And then on the second half of the class, we're going to pray in the corner because I heard once that, you know, Lord God answers prayers and delivers us magic on us. Like you, like, it's like you're taking two things that don't mix and you're trying to make them mix. That's all I'm saying. But either way. No, but my question is, how do we know? That pure constraint-led training okay. is more right. effective than constraint-led training with also showing techniques. Because it's been studied. How do we know that? Because if, if you if you read the literature, if you read the research. Has it been studied in jiu-jitsu? You're not understanding. Human behavior is human behavior, right? So they try to catalog what type of behavior it is to try to determine which methods might be more effective for creating this behavior again or making it more repeatable or make it more effective or whatever. So in, in, so the thing else we talked about before in our notes previously, I actually took this note down that we talked about uh, the information processing uh, model. We, we talked about behavior as being three types, discrete, serial, or continuous. Now, um, the, the truth is, is that a jitsu is a, a continuous game. No matter how discrete the actions or serial the actions may seem, it's, it's a continuous and complex game. Uh, and so anyway, they tried to use this to determine what practices would affect those types of skills the most. And again, this isn't purely ecological what I'm describing. I'm trying to describe how um, they tried to separate the idea of what, um, uh, how, to, how to classify the skill, right? And so the more complex continuous a skill is, the more variation that's present in the environment and between tasks and so within the individuals interacting that we couldn't account for it through explicit instruction. So again, the more complex and continuous a game gets, let's assume that that's, that's true. 
uh, because again, I don't know to what degree a game is complex or continuous. And nobody does. I'm just saying we could compare it to like gymnastics. Gymnastics is, is different than let's say, you know, jiu-jitsu. And let's say gymnastics is more a serial in approach because it's a pre-planned step-by-step thing we're learning versus where jujitsu is um, uh, uncooperative. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, it's unplanned, right? So anyway, in complex continuous games, since there's a high amount of variation, part of the skill of learning is adapting to this, vari- this variation. So attuning to it and then letting our skills adapt to the variation present within the environment. Explicit instruction is the opposite of that. Explicit instruction is trying to freeze frame a moment and say, you should do this here, but that here will never repeat again. And that you should do this will never repeat again. So you're, you're using a mechanism to try to create a behavior that one will never be repeated twice. And two will never be within the same situation to have been repeated twice. I think to say, I think to say that it will never be repeated again is somewhat hyperbolic. It isn't. Because yes, there's, there is infinite factors. You're right. But that doesn't mean that infinite variables necessarily mean that a situation is so different that it can't be repeated. It certainly can. No. Even if my opponent, you know, is, it doesn't mean I'm going to fight the same guy or he's going to, you know, he's not going to have the same amount of sweat. Yes, there's infinite variables, but. They to say that I can't repeat the same move ever again is, I think, <clears throat> not necessarily. Uh, no, it's not accurate. It is accurate. It's it's the, what's not accurate is your level of analysis. So, what you are calling a move, uh, it changes every time you say the word. So most people are like, okay, what's a move? And they'll say like arm lock. Okay, but but where is the move? Is it the angle of my head leg or is it the angle of my body leg, or? Is it how my hands are grasped? Where's the move? Where's the move? Well, when I say when you say move, I guess we're talking about the technique okay, so, of the arm bar. So where is the... But it could be in di- many different situations. Yes, that's <laughs> exactly. true. Exactly. There's an infinite amount of arm locks. So what ties them all together is invariance. So we attune our students' intention and attention to the invariance present in a given situation. And then self-organization takes over from there, right? Because we can't uh, freeze all the degrees of freedom present in a given situation through explicit instruction because they never appear the same way twice, right? So an easy way to like try to think about this in your mind, if you had 27 different degrees of flexion in your wrist, right? And 37 different degrees of flexion and change in your elbow and then maybe 11 in your shoulder, Every, th- those are basically, if you were to take like 26 different ways, a wrist moved 37 different ways, the elbow moved and 11 different ways, a shoulder moved. Do you realize how vast that number is? If you put them all together and they're like, you know, 27 in, in one degree, tw- tw- 27 in one degree, 26 and two, it, it's the variation is infinite. Yes. By no means. What is the same arm swing ever repeated twice? Even something as simple as an arm swing. Never in history is repeated twice. The number's too vast. Now, let's make that more complex and put two people together together and have them fight into this like amalgamation of limbs and levers and movement and pressures and sweat and fatigue. And those numbers go through the roof. How do you address students who repeat the same mistakes in situations? So or they or they're do they they don't reach the solution effectively because they're repeating the same behaviors. Right. So this is the problem with learning. This is why not everyone gets great. This is why not everyone becomes good. This is why some people train something for 10 years and still suck. This is why some people dedicate their whole lives to a craft and are still trash. This is the nature of reality. Yeah. There's so much at play at any given time that there are so many problems to solve, not only with a given individual, but a room full of individuals and a world full of individuals. So there could be many reasons why this is taking place. But explaining to them the one super secret technique of arm lock doesn't solve the problem either. <clears throat> but okay, so, so how do you address someone who repeats the same mistakes? Well, first we have to you put them you 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 say, okay, student, self-organize here. Nope. This is the job, nope. this is the task, nope. or this is this this is the uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, so first we start um, with a general problem that we all have to solve. So we start with invariance. Every top player has the same job. They have to stay on top and hold their partner down. That's the main task. So every top, everything that ever happens from being on top of somebody is predicated on our ability to stay on top and hold our partner down. 
Okay, that's not debatable, right? You agree with that? Yeah. Okay, so that means everything they do, no matter whether arm locking, strangling, choking, passing, here, there, that's their main job. So we first start to teach a student to organize around that while performing different tasks. Sometimes we're staying on top and holding them down while passing their legs. Sometimes we're staying on top and holding them down while we're arm locking them. But either way, their success on top will be directly predicated on that, on that skill, right? So now as they try that, they'll face problems, okay? So I have a student who's like, all right, coach, every time I get here, and they give me an example, uh, the mounted position, my, I fall over. Okay, great. Why are you falling over? I don't know. Well, what are you intending to do? Okay, I'm trying to stay on top and hold him down. So why aren't you able to? What's happening to you? Well, I don't know. Well, great. Keep trying it until you can tell me what's happening to you. Okay, so he goes back and tries and tries and tries. It's like, okay, I figured it out. I keep trapping my arm. Every time they trap my arm and they move, I fall over. Great. So let's start in this position. And every time they capture your arm, don't let them. See if that helps. Go. You give them a focus of intention and attention. You let them coordinate a movement solution to solve that problem. That movement solution will, it, it will either be stable or unstable. And then uh, based on its level of stability, it will try to solve the myriad of problems in a given situation. As soon as it becomes destabilized and something happens, as someone acts against it, we can now look at that. And we can refocus our students' intention and attention to form a new movement solution and try to stabilize that new movement solution under that situation that they're describing to me. And then we go again. And so what we do is we give them a focus, we allow a problem to arise, and then we try to face that problem by giving them a new focus. And we just keep repeating this. But they're always doing live work. They're always doing this live resistance. It's always true. Nothing has to be explained. Nothing has to be remembered. They get to interact. So when they come to you and they say, hey, I'm having this problem, I keep falling off from the mount, <clears throat> do, you, do you always like to respond by asking them why they think that's happening? Yes, because really self-learning is the only level, of, the only, only true learning, okay? If you just remember what I say and use it, you still have to go through the self-learning pro process to internalize or whatever or understand what I'm trying to tell you, okay, whatever language you want to use. Um, but I want them to be able to self uh self-criticize. I want them to be able to know what their intention was. And I want them to be able to recognize what was happening to them because it's, that's their perception. So if they can perceive what's happening, they can act against it. And once they act against it, it will change how they perceive the situation. So keeping them coupled in that, in, in that, you know, perception action loop and getting it to understand that that's where they are will help the learning process go forward. It's part of the skill. So again, attuning them to both what they're intending to do and what's happening to them is learning. And so the questions basically do that. They help me focus that attention so they can try again and maybe come up with a new movement solution to solve that problem. What if they're not so, um, what, uh, what if they're not aware enough to recognize that they're even making a problem? They just keep making the pro same problem. They don't come to you. They don't say, hey, I'm having this problem, but yet they're still repeating the same mistakes. Well, they're not. Do you just they're not, not address it or well, do you address yeah, it? For sure. So we have to be honest, guys, like there are good students. There are bad students. There are good learners. There are bad learners. Now, it doesn't mean that a bad learner can't be a good learner and a bad student can't be a good student. But the first thing they have to do is invest in the process. They have to have some intention to be there. Why are we here? What do we want to become? What do we want practice to afford us? What do we want? And so part of that intention is to search, to figure things out. Students who are more committed to the searching and figuring out part tend to be better students. And so if I have a guy in the back corner who trains twice a week and every now and then, doesn't ask questions, doesn't, doesn't do any searching on, uh, in the sport or anything, and yeah, screw that guy, okay? He's not gonna take up any of my time, like, you know, because he's not invested and that's okay. Maybe he just likes to come here and get sweaty. Let him have his problems. Let him have some fun. But he's not here to learn because he's not investing in that process. So as the coach, if you don't see that commitment from him, if he's not going to realize that he's making the same mistake, you just let him drown, basically. I don't let him drown. Again, I'm not daddy. I'm not savior, lord, jujitsu, Greg Souders. I'm here to offer a learning opportunity to you. I'm going to be here seven days a week with all my focus of attention on you guys. I'm going to be here for you guys every single day. So if you come here and you want to utilize the environment that I've created for you, you must interact with it. You must utilize it. It's not my job to chase you around and be your accountability buddy. You know what I mean? Now, this doesn't mean that if I see a student struggling, I won't go help them. Of course I will. But if that struggle is related to their inability to engage in practice, I can't solve that. Like, how do I make you be less lazy, less fat, less distracted? I can't. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I can't. I can't solve that problem. Unless you want help solving it.
Cool. Um, let's switch gears here. I got a question for you. Um, how do you, and again, I, maybe I know the answer. Maybe yeah. I'm assuming. How do you feel about solo drills in terms of increasing movements like, uh, or acqu acquiring, acquiring movement uh, for skill acquisition? For sure. Um, so I don't like to differentiate between movements because I don't think like, I think there's this myth that movements translate to this movements translates to this. I think that moving in variable ways can enhance your ability to move in any way. Right. So, you know, a lot of our guys strength condition, a lot of our guys do like movement practices or whatever. And I think that's good. I think the more you move your body around the world and the more variable ways you challenge your movement system to, to organize in different ways, the more attuned you become to movement. And so, uh, I like the idea in a general sense, but, uh, I think we make the mistake if we say something like this transfers to jujitsu, unless you're doing what you're doing, it's a live resisting body. There's no transfer. So move, if you like, enhance your strength and skill and speed and athleticism, because that will enhance your ability to use that as a constraint when you try to perform the act of jujitsu, but there's no direct transfer if that's what you're asking. So <clears throat> I've, I, one of the instructionals I'm deep into right now is the Tynan Dalpra long step masterclass. Cause I'm, I really want to make my, I know it's going to be music to your ears. I want to improve my gi game. Right. Okay. So I'm watching like the AOJ guys. I find that like just their movement and their gi game is some of the best in the world, especially at the lighter weight yeah. classes. So I'm really like, I'm trying to emulate guys like Tynan, uh, when in the top position and see how he passes the guard, because I personally, for me, I find it, um, it's different from no gi situations, just from all the different variables. Right. Uh, and, and honestly, the, 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 the movements are, I find completely different gi and no gi completely. just because there's the ability to grab cloth and things like that. Right. Yeah, like we, absolutely. we kind of, we can use certain grips and use the gi to our advantage. Right? right. And so one thing he talks about in this instructional is there's, there's a video or two that's on solo movements. Okay. And he talks about, uh, using the solo drills that they've created, him and Guy Mendes have created to develop your long step. I don't know what you'd want to call it. Your your patterns. Your you, so that when you get to the long step position, you've been there and you can you can replicate the movement kind of without a, a conscious thought. Okay, so he says that once he started doing the long step solo drills, mm -hmm. his long step improved greatly, and even I've noticed this after practicing the solo drill where you're kind of shifting your weight side to side and, and then you practice the movement, it feels much more comfortable in the live situation. And I find that it, it hasn't, in, um, uh, it's improved the, my ability to execute the move in a live situation. So what, how do you feel about, you know, probably looking at the best long step passer in the world or one of the best long step passers in the world in Tynan Dalpra, his opinion of saying that the solo drill has really, you know, had a positive effect in his ability to execute that against resistance. It has no effect on me because I know that's not a thing. So, but what I do know is a thing is that he's intending to be good at something. He really likes a, what he considers a pattern of movement that helps him get to where he's going. Also, what I do know is he's practiced that against live resistance against some of the best grapplers on planet Earth. So the question really is, what makes his long step good? Is it his commitment and intention to make that movement pattern something that he uses against the highest level guys in the sport that he plays? Or is it the silly solo drill he's sharing with you to get you to buy his program? So I would think that the, the former is a better explanation for what's happening than the latter. Like, um, again, there is no generalized motor program. That's not a thing. Okay. It doesn't exist, but people <clears throat> think it does. He says it, he says in the instructional that before, um, before the solo movement, he was having tons of issues hitting it in live situations. Then after using the solo movement, live situations, the, the long step movement became very much more effective. So how is that not, how could that not be, um, how could that not be part of the learning process or accelerate the learning process? I, again, his opinion on the matter has no effect on anything that is true about reality. So he's claiming something 
He's saying that this has an effect on this. The burden of proof is on him. If he feels like it is, congratulations. But it tells us nothing about what we should or shouldn't do. Again, this is an argument from authority. This is not, this is, this is a logical fallacy. This is, this isn't anything. He's not telling us anything about the mechanisms at play that make us good at a thing. He's just saying, I do this, therefore. Man, I could say that, man, I became a better speaker when I put on tank tops. My whole life before I put on tank tops and I wore sleeveless shirts, I couldn't speak with as much clarity. But the second I put this tank top on, the words flow from my mouth and my stream of consciousness becomes 10 times stronger by my tank tops. I mean, like that's what's happening. You know what I mean? But people, see, the thing but is- But his results, his results and his ability to, to do that move- at the highest level doesn't make him a candidate for having uh, no. for that opinion to have validity. No, what? Because we have to look at what's actually going on. Ignore the words. Look what's happening. He is a young and passionate grappler who wants to be good at the sport of gi grappling. He trains with two of the best grapplers to ever put their feet on the ground, and they are specific. They are known for that type of movement, staying long and away, holding the ends, left and right movement. This is something that th those two, uh, Guy and Hafa, are extremely good at. So when they interact with each other in that environment, they're affecting each other. And this is why he's good at it. What he says is the reason is just the poor mechanisms that we have for determining why one thing happens versus another. He's just you know, a primate like the rest of us just trying to figure this shit out. He has no idea because he has no way to collect that data. He has no way to collect that data and says, this is the action that made it different. I mean, does he eat pickles? Maybe it was the pickles he eats. Maybe he has a pickle diet. And for some reason that pickle gives him long step power. I mean, it, it, it's like, it's random. It's random. <clears throat> How do you know Guy and Hafa are some of the best <sighs> Guy grapplers in the world? Fuck. First, I, I trained with him for, I don't know, three or four months back in 2008. Holy shit. Like, those guys are unreal. Their dedication to training and how serious and focused they are is crazy. They're so good. Uh, now, that was my personal experience with them. Now, when I watch them grapple, they are fantastic technicians. They're amazing at what they do. They're good competitors. They have great mechanics. They have complete grappling skill sets. They can do many different things. They can they can take down to a specific degree. They pass extremely well. They back take extremely well. And they do it against the highest level of resistance at the highest caliber of competition. That's I'm a, that's why I think they're good. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe they suck. But based on my perception of who they are and why watching their abilities, man, these, these two are amazing. And even if they were to say, you know, Long, uh, solo movements and things like that have really helped us get to this level. And we can all agree that they're very, very good. You still think that that's not based in reality. That's yeah. just their perception. I do because think about it. They're trying to take an entire history of who they are as people. And they're trying to compress it into what they think works, but understand they were training since they were young kids. They trained in like a really small room in Brazil with some of the, the best players at the time. I mean, I think the original coach is Ramon Lemos. That dude's a beast too. A lot of people who touched that guy or came in that room were super good. You know what I mean? So maybe there was something going on in that room at that time that sparked what they are now, right? And then their interaction with each other and their whole path through starting and where they became, there's so many variables in that time span. There's so many things that have happened that could contribute to why they became the way they came. Became. So for them to just try to distill down the one aspect of skill based on this one thing that they did, that, that's, just, that's just us guessing. Again, it's not data. We can't, I mean, if we were to study that, so what we would probably have to do is we'd probably have to take some students from them. We would have to stop, let it do no live grappling, only these solo drills, okay, for maybe a few months, okay, is however you want to teach them, and then put them back in a guard passing environment and see if their guard passing has improved. So but I'm have, not saying use only solo drills at all. I'm just saying to add that to your training, which would, also include live situations and tons of constraint-led training as well. So I, I'm more of an advocate for a, uh, what I would believe, what I would call a balanced or um, an, an approach that has different types of training, including constraint-led approach. If it's good, solo training, uh, technique training, situational, whatever you want to call it. But I, I'm more of, I find that the, uh, the best would be like a combination of all of them. So again, how do we know 
that ecological train, just ecological training trumps any other approach or a mixture of any approach because I don't know what other how many approach. pure ecological, how many pure ecological world champions are there? So see, again, you're, you, that, is it just too new? It's no, 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 no. Like we can't say that. Okay. we we first have to discuss the robustness of the science. What does the science say? What has the science shown to be true or at least argued, uh, is probable by a significant degree. We have to look at that first, right? Because we're talking about trying to help people learn how to move, to create movement. And this is what is happening in all sport. Okay, so we're trying to create methods where we can manipulate what we understand about ecological dynamics to try to enhance a person's ability to learn based on the problems they're facing while learning. Like that's what we are discussing. So what other method is there? Tell me what other framework, okay, what framework are you coming from when you talk about the effectiveness of solo drilling? Just give me a mechanism, something that would, that would make that more true than, than not as it relates to acquiring skill. Say that again. Okay. What framework are you utilizing to determine the effectiveness of doing something solo? <clears throat> well, aside from my own mm -mm. my own ability to be able to land the technique live and my ability to be able to take kids who've never done the long step before and I show them we work through the solo movement um or sorry, I show them the move, I sh we try the long step and we even situationally spar let's say the split squat position where a lot of these long steps are happening try to get them to do that position and them having uh not a lot of success and then showing them the movement pattern of the solo drill and then having them try to situational spar again and then them being able to start using it in live training this is actually something that i've i've seen in the kids and in the adults of all levels and from my own uh my own ability uh my own experiences that uh, that that is where i've noticed that this solo movement has definitely improved pretty much everyone's that i've observed and also what the mendez bro say and what tynan says um it's it's improved all of our performance in the situation is that not a measure of, and to some degree, is that not data that's been collected? I know it's not a scientific study. I know it's not a scientific paper, but it is, uh, it's based on my observation and from my own personal experience and the personal experience of, you know, the best in the world at that technique. But you're not isolating variables. You're not noting confounders. The issue is, is you don't know what's having an effect. You're just assuming. Like the thing is, is there are many things that happen to you as a learner. So if I took a person and I had them try to solve a specific problem, let's say I wanted them to pass the guard in a specific way. Okay. And I let them try a few times and they failed. And I walked up to that person and I said, okay, look, I want you to put your hands here, practice this movement five times. And I showed them the long step pass. And I said, get back in and do it. Start with these grips. They would hit the long step pass. They would. But what effect does that have on them as the learner? How does that teach them how to read their environment? by intending to do something? How does this attune their information to the, the, the specifying information they need to form an action? And how does my explanation of this and having them practice it in a solo way make them flexible and adaptable as that movement pattern stabilizes and faces further perturbations? How do I solve that problem by doing a solo drill? What within the solo drill solves those problems that we know exist in any mover, in any situation? Well, I think it it gives the student the the proper pattern There's because no the proper long pattern. step pass can be, well, the, the, the main thing that I see is that people, they mix up the long step and the back step and they tend to do it from a range that is not effective, but they quite often don't know what range they should be doing it from. But when you do the solo movement, it instantly creates a situation where they develop the range and they develop the movement and it gives them the 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 movement pattern to to long step in such a wide angle that they're um that they can apply it m more quickly in a live situation from what i've seen 
but again, you, like you're, what you're saying. How do we know it's, how do, how do we know? Okay, so we could say this. We could say, <clears throat> we could say, how do we know that it is, uh, that the, the movement is not creating, it's not improving the skill or it's not transferring the skill. Because okay, we could say that. But how do we know that it's not? Because it's being studied now. Like you're just taking your jujitsu subset and you're trying to make it mean something it doesn't mean. So in other sporting contexts and in other other studies where they've studied movement in general and all different types of movement, discrete movements, pattern movements, zero movements, continuous movements, complex movements. When they put this up to scrutiny, what you're saying works doesn't show up. It doesn't. And so they're, they're, what I'm telling you guys is this isn't Greg Souter's opinion. This is not my opinion. These, these are people who are smarter and, and way above me in this. And there are, they've, been doing, they've been doing research on this for the last 100 years. And the thing that you're saying happens does not happen. That's what I'm saying. So again, you're saying that the human, you're making a claim about the effect that my actions have on my ability to learn. You're, you're making a claim about reality based on your personal experience. But people who have studied that experience that you and others have, because we've all had that experience, but we don't know what that experience means. So when people look at it with scrutiny, the effect that you think you're having disappears. It doesn't exist. But correct me if I'm wrong. Are those studies, they're on other athletic sports. They're probably not on jujitsu and probably not on the long step pass, right? But like, there's no studies on that. But no, I'm, I'm very confused. What do you mean? So I, I'm just saying, like you're saying, you know, the, the hundred years of scientific studies about how, you know, we can, how people learn motor movements, things like that, and how, uh, and, and how there's no correlation between the sol using solo movements to improve an athlete's performance. Right. How do we know that that correlates to a jujitsu situation or even a specific guard pass situation? Because a move, if there's never been a study on that, because movements emerge relative to the task they're performing. The long step does not exist without gi grips and without the game of jiu-jitsu. It doesn't exist. Okay, but how, how is that scientific evidence that doing that solo movement will not increase your performance? Because doing a movement doesn't increase performance. That's what I'm telling you. Pick any sport. But where's the evidence of that? What do you mean? There's, there's, there's a hundred years of science backing this. Like they've studied what you're asking. So they've taken athletes in different contexts and have them repeat movements. They've done exactly what, what you're saying. What about in a jiu-jitsu context? But I don't understand why is jiu-jitsu context different? What's the difference between... Well, even what about like a wrestling context? What about a, what about a situation where, you know, wrestlers and judo fighters will, will drill repetitions because uh, they're looking to increase their performance? Is that the wrong methodology? Yes, because they're doing it because they don't know what works. They're just doing it because they think it works. But then when we, when someone, so someone says, Hey, I think this works. And then science goes, okay, let's see if it works. And they do the same thing. And they say, Oh, well, it doesn't work. That, that's what Have I'm Have there saying. been studies on judo and wrestlers as well? Yes. And, uh, using this. Wrestling has been studied. Judo has been studied. Basketball, uh, pressing buttons, boxing, uh, fucking race car driving. Like, dude, any human movement that you can think of has been studied. This isn't, it's like, it's funny. It, it's the strangest thing. Like people can't hear this. You, again, you're doing the same thing. You're asking if a study of jujitsu specifically has been done yet. You're saying the strength of your personal experience. Which it hasn't probably. No, of course it hasn't been done because this is not, they're studying. Well, jujitsu is a very small, it's a very small activity. So it costs a right. lot to do these studies. So for them to, I mean, there would have to be a guy who researches, who likes jujitsu to do it unless, or unless we donated a bunch of money and got them to do it for us, but <laughs> that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? The studies are going to go where the money goes. But again, you, you don't need to study the mm -hmm. specific thing. Human behavior is human. So you behavior. would say, you would say that the Mendez brothers and Tynan Dalpra are saying, Hey, this long, this long step solo movement, you practice it. It, it will, it can help you execute the movement is just a, not a true statement. Uh, yes. Because it's not, okay. but it, but it's not based on it because you understand what a true statement means. Right. Why, why isn't me saying it stronger than what they're saying it? So like, if I say it doesn't work, 
why is that not the equal strength to them saying it does work? Because they can hit it on world champions and they've done it in a live situation and they have the titles to prove it. I passed Leandro's guard. I took his back. He got so mad he punched me in the face. Like, <laughs> is that a true story? Yes. <laughs> so, Holy fuck. so like, like I pass high level guards too. It's like, so you know what I'm saying? So that's not an excuse for anything. It doesn't matter what one person can do. What one person can do is the result of many things having been done. Just because they say that this is the thing they think affects it doesn't necessarily make that true, right? So if somebody says mm. this is the reason why this exists, then we have to put that to scrutiny. And then we have to let the, the scrutiny that we put it to or, or determine whether that is a true statement or not. Otherwise, all, all of our opinions are equally valid. And if all of our opinions are equally valid, then there's no truth. Mm -hmm. So, but... um. So what what kind of scrutiny would need to would need to happen to to see if using that solo movement plus live situational sparring could be more effective than just purely live situational sparring? Yeah. So in the studies that you're that you say don't have any value, what they do is they uh, hey I didn't say that they set up a condition where they have uh, a person practice with task focus, for example, they have a group of people practice with task focus. They have another group of people who practice with explicit instruction. They have a, a group that does both and then they have a control group. And what they do is they look at the statistical differences between the outcomes that they're searching for. And then they compare these statistical differences to see which training methodology had a greater or not, or didn't have an effect at all. And the more this is repeated, the stronger the argument for the ecological approach is becoming because they didn't, mm -hmm. because every time they put it up to scrutiny, it outperforms all other methods of instruction, like across the board. And even so, you know what the most surprising thing is, is a guy named Wolfgang Schollhorn. You can look him up. He's a researcher who studies differential learning. His crazy ass experiments are blowing all the other ones out of the water. Him getting people to like hop on one leg while they're kicking a ball or blink their eyes or do crazy things is producing more learning in the individual than doing what we would call prescriptive drills to create an effect. So man, like, this research is going so far that it's really throwing the traditional method on its face. <clears throat> okay. Um, can I ask you some questions? Cause I have people messaging me. They, they, they want to ask you questions. Is that cool? Oh, man, I'm down for whatever. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the level of intensity in a practice room and the ability to be creative or fluid and explore more possible movement solutions. Does increasing the intensity of li in live practice in any way stifle the athlete's ability to explore? Hmm. I, I think so. But I think we first have to define intensity. How are we measuring it, right? So are we using a small time window? Say, okay, you've got to get this outcome in three minutes. In that case, yes, that's very extreme. That's very intense. It's hard to explore movement in three minutes. It could make it worse. We could go 90 seconds. We could say, hey, today, guys, we're going to explore the single leg takedown. You have 90 seconds to get a hold of your partner's leg and put them on the mat. That's way too intense for exploration, right? But what you could do is you could put somebody in a 10-minute round, right? You put, put them in 10 minutes on the clock, start them in a single leg, and you could give them an effect that you want them to explore. And you can give the other student a task that would allow exploration to occur. You could say, like, the guy who's getting their leg held, you could say something like, I don't want you to try to free your leg. Instead, I want you to try to keep your balance any way that you can. Do not let your hips hit the floor. And then you could give the person who's trying to interact with that player, you could say, I want you to explore how many different ways you can interact with that secondary leg to make their hips hit the floor. And so we get a low urgency in time, and then we get a task focus that doesn't create urgency uh, based on its interaction with the other. And then we can get a nice, robust, exploratory environment where students get to exchange at a rate that's allowable within the constraints that were set. Very nice. Okay. I have another question. It's about false positives. If the ecological method is centered around self-organization of movement solutions, how does uh, you, Greg Souders, as a coach, mitigate false positives in his athletes? And what is the main mechanism in their practice that filters out false positives? Well, I don't know how a false positive would exist in an ecological approach, in the ecological approach. I don't because I'm not trying to explicitly get anything to come out of it. I'm trying to let whatever comes out of it come out of it, right? So this is the problem with training anyway, right? So 
what we do in the training environment should create some kind of change in the performance environment. Now, the goal is to let those two things be the same thing. So, for example, while we're training, we're also trying to perform. So while I'm trying to perform or reach some end objective, I'm going to either be effective at doing so or ineffective at doing so in, in, within a degree. And so, again, I don't know what a false positive would be if we're just looking for an outcome, right? A false positive would be something like, I chose this game and it was this game that made this happen. I don't know if that's true because learning by itself is nonlinear. We do not know how proportional the input is to the output. We don't know that. And I don't know that either. But what I do know is if you focus your students' intention and attention, and you, you can use that to stabilize a movement solution, and then you uh, expose it to perturbations, it becomes adaptable and flexible. And those false positives are weeded out by the very nature of practice itself. <clears throat> okay. Um, thought you were going to get me on that one, didn't you? Yeah, I know. I know. <clears throat> well, it's not me. It's it's someone else's question. <laughs> I know. I'm teasing that I have my own questions one. for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Here's a question. Uh, for, I guess it's relating to you as a cornerman for your students during competitions. For sure. Um, what does your feedback from the sidelines sound like? Give an example. Uh, this person says, say you see someone, you're not going to like this. Say you see someone <laughs> in the perfect position yeah. to take an underhook or hit a throw by or swing a leg into saddle. This is not a very well written question. It's though. all right. I read that. <laughs> what do you, do? How do you give? How do you, how do you give, um, uh, corner advice during a match? Like, are you specific with your instruction? What do you, what would be some things you might say? So the thing is, is once we hit the training environment or excuse me, the performance environment, our training is done. We've already done, I've already done my job. I'm just there to show up to, yeah. to sort of help focus their attention if they lose it. So I try to use the same language that I use in my room. So I don't, I don't see things that randomly pop up. Like I watch my students tr learn and perform every day. So I know what's going to happen with DeAndre. I know what's going to happen with Gavin. I know what's going to happen with Noah. I know what's going to happen with Brian. So I coach them based on how I know them, based on what we've been training and how we've been training it. So I like to yell from the sidelines. I try to keep them focused on external sources of information. Like somebody's asking me about the, this Gavin thing where I was like, fight for the middle, fight for the middle. Right? I was trying to cue him on getting between his partner's knees because we play a game in the overhook underhook situation where we try to fight to win that center space. And so that was my attempt to cue him into that information if he wasn't already aware of it. And as you saw, Gavin was very aware of it and was able to counter his opponent. So again, my cornering is just to be there with my guys to try to keep their attention focused. And of course, to talk a little shit to their opponents to make them feel psychologically uncomfortable. You talk shit to, to the opponents or you get your students oh, yeah. to talk shit? No, to I do. Opponents? No, uh, no, I tell my students, man, like, don't talk shit. Let your, let your uh, performance show. You don't need to say anything. What do you say? He's getting tired. He's, he's oh, yeah. not very good there. Like for yeah. sure. Because I realize this, if the, if the coach and the opponent want to fight me, they're fighting two people. So mm. man, I, I try to make them hate me. I'm like, man, I want them to focus on me. So yeah, it's, it's like kind of a little psychological warfare. So I love to talk shit when I'm- So what's, what type of things would you yell? Like, I'll, I'll say random shit like, um, I thought we came to fight. God, that guy must have, you know, <clears throat> left his notebook in the parking lot. You know what I mean? Or like when like Big Dan came up to me and it was like, <laughs> he, he was like, uh, um, hey man, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a cornering against you. So I want to wish you good luck. And I was like, oh, we don't need luck, man. We brought some skill. And then I, I was just being playful with him, but uh, he thought I was meaning something else. And after Gavin beat his guy, I walked up to him. and I said, hey, maybe I should have wished you luck. Um, I don't know. I just I like I like I like to fuck around. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's all playful because the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And that shit doesn't affect me either. You can say whatever you want to me, literally whatever you want. I, I, I'll, I'll stop. I, I'll barely hear it. And when I leave, I'll probably stop thinking about you. OK, here's another question. Um how it's a very vague question. The question is how to improve an athlete's decision making and competition. Oh, but no, maybe I will reframe that. That's a great question. Hey, that's maybe I'll reframe question. it as like, yeah. is, is there methods or, 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 uh, things that you do that can improve an athlete's decision making and competition? Yes. The ecological approach. I'm being okay, dead. Just, I'm being, just no, purely. Yeah, I'm being dead serious because what it was. So what the ecological approach suggests is that information is direct, and all behaviors are relative to the task being performed uh, by the individual in the environment is being performed in. So 
in order to perform or to get movement to emerge, you have to intend to do things and focus your attention, which is all centered around decision making. Right. And so when I'm performing tasks in the live environment that I'm actually going to be fighting in, we get very good action fidelity or action fidelity. So basically the movements that I'm choosing to make for the reasons I'm choosing to make them, I'm making them in the live resistance environment. So you're actually training decision making. Decision making is part of the performance environment. So we get that out of the way in practice. Right. So, again, by focusing, saying, hey, this is your task. I'm challenging them to make decisions relative to that task. So they're actually training it. So that should transfer to performance. So if my practice is well-designed, they'll make good decisions in the performance environment because they were making those decisions in training. It transfers. <clears throat> Makes sense. Uh, another question. How do you go about incorporating the ecological approach as a student if my school or any school nears me near me do it? Uh, yeah. Maybe some stuff. Mm, yeah. How to go about incorporating the ecological <laughs> approach as a student. I, I don't know. This is kind of a weird question. No, I know it? what he's saying. So okay. he's probably at a traditional spot and he's got to sit through the drills. He's got to sit through the warm ups, and he's frustrated because he would like to try to just train. Right. So first, I always urge everyone, man, learn the science, like truly fucking don't even listen to me. OK, like assume that I'm a purple belt at this shit. Rob Gray, Michael Turvey, Ian Renshaw, Keith Davids. These fucking guys are black belts at this shit. So read the science, learn the science, inform yourself. Don't let me be your only voice. Do not let me be your only source of information. That's a mistake. Okay. Now, and again, don't believe shit people tell you, man. Read the fucking research, man. It's out there for you. So you don't have to, you know, Look up to your guru and hope that he delivers you down the trinkets of information that you're looking for. The second thing I would say is when you're in the environment, always have an intention. Know what you want out of your practice, not only for the hour, but for each moment. What are you trying to do when you're on top? What are you trying to do when you're on bottom? Create an intention for yourself and focus your attention. What's the best way I could go about doing this, right? If their feet are on me, what should I do about that? What's the best way I right now can go about solving the problems that I'm facing? So, have an intention for yourself, have attention, and please inform yourself of the science and you can start using it on your own. This guy thinks he's going to send me five questions and I'm going to answer all of them. So I'll pick one of them. Um, okay. He says, um, he says meta stability oh, okay. in jujitsu. Should, should you explain how the concept of meta stability applies to training and competing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and how it influences the athlete's ability to adapt in dynamic situations. Okay, when we stabilize a movement solution, it can become metastable. So there's a region of space that we work within that's stable in and of itself, which basically means that when we reach a space, there's not much change going on or not much variability, and we can use stable movement solutions to solve problems, but also, uh, or based on our, the uh, our previous exploits, but we can also create new novel movement solutions in that same space. So an example would be something like uh, putting your partner's arms into extension. So for the top player, if I have double underhooks and their arms are extension, this is a very metastable position uh, because extension affords the opportunity for many things while solving a lot of problems. So again, we could use that to exploit what we know, but we could also come up with brand new uh, 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 novel solutions on the spot. Right. So it's a it's a it's a space that we work within that's stable in and of itself and allows for many movement solutions to emerge. Again, one we've already stabilized and one we already haven't. Uh, it's a it's a not an easy concept and it's a little bit difficult to describe. So what I would ask you to do is go learn about metastability and try to understand it for yourself. All right. Another question. Can you explain to the community the concept of self-organization and how too much feedback or technical feedback will interrupt this natural and predominantly non-conscious process for this is the path that focus on improving our knowledge of in any psychomotor domain. Uh, I don't know what that means. But you're, like, your attention is like a depleting resource, right? So you can only pay attention um, to so many things. All right. So the, the, there's a, a, there's a lot of noise is going on when you're interacting and there's a signal within that noise. And what we're trying to do is attune to that signal. That signal is information that we need that affords opportunity for action. 
Okay. So if our attention is elsewhere, it'll be more difficult for us to pick up that specifying information, that necessary information. So again, attention is a resource that we have to manage well. If we don't manage it well, it, it, we're, we're not going to be as effective at creating movement solutions as we otherwise would. Okay. So uh, anything, anything that takes your attention away from the environment and the task is bad. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, So this is a question that actually I had, but someone else has um, has asked. So I will I will ask this question partially of my own selfishness, and it's a gi related question. You cool with that? I know you. Oh, love dude, the gi. it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I don't care. Okay. Uh, well, I, I my questions are: What technical advice would you offer someone who wanted to get better in the gi who focuses primarily on no gi? What about vice versa, right? A, a gi person who wants to get better at, at no gi. Um, do you think, uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. How, how about we'll just start with that. What what advice would you give for someone who's a no gi fighter wants to transition more to the gi or vice versa? Pick one, man. Like, I don't know. Like the thing is. is okay, I'll be, I'll pick my own. No gi to gi. <laughs> uh, I think you should just start putting the gi on and turn the gi on most of the time. Okay. If you want to be good at, or excuse me, if you want to be good at gi, put the gi on and train gi most of the time. If you want to be good at no gi, put no, take your shit off and train no gi most of the time. Uh, again, we attune to the environment that we put ourselves in, uh, and all of our skills we develop are very sensitive to that attunement, to that environment, to those tasks we're performing in that environment. And so again, every, by picking one, you're going to become more sensitive to the information and your movement solutions are going to be, like I said, more stable in that, in that space. So again, pick one, just go into that direction. If you want to do both, that's fine. Uh, yeah, let's say I want to do both, man. You're going to have to split your time. Well, okay. And get a good coach to help guide you along the way. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Some guys are able to do it. Well, some guys aren't, uh, I think the, one of the issues that we haven't seen happen yet is the, the divergence between the two. I think it's already started, but I think that as these two things get further and further away from each other, I think the ability to perform well in both sports is going to diminish not for everybody, but for most. And I think it's a time. I think I think we are seeing I think we are seeing that uh, division in the gi and no gi now. We're we're seeing very much specialist gi and specialists in no gi, and we're seeing guys who play the gi game in a no gi situation, and they're just not as effective as no gi guys. Yeah, it's actually. Uh, I think we already see that. Right? Oh yeah, we definitely see it it's because they, because it already started to happen. Like originally, we didn't see it that much because it was just gi guys taking the gi off and fighting each other, so it looked kind of okay. Yeah. But we notice it here a lot when people come in and they train a lot of gi. It's funny. Like I trained gi for 12 years. So I recognize movement patterns and I can see them searching for affordances that are just not there. Like they're attuned and I can see it. It's so funny. Like the way they reach up and the way they structure their body because they're expecting like a pull where there isn't or they're expecting stickiness where there isn't. And it's funny because you can see the twitchiness. You can see like they're trying to organize right there because they have no idea what to attune to. And I can see its effects. Yeah. So your advice for, for a guy like me who is, you know, more, I would say more effective in a no gi situation is to literally just change my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> and put more, put the gi on more often. For sure. Because, um, cause that's, so you said, you said I should, I should, you know, find a guy who can coach me in the gi. So let's say, you know, you had the ability to be that coach. What would you say? Like, what are some things that a gi coach could tell me that would make me better well, as a no gi fighter primarily that could make me become, could accelerate my efficiency or effectiveness in the gi? Well, what I tell you is not going to help you. It's how I design your practice. So I would. Try right. So how would you do that? I would have to create. I was going to ask you, like, could, I was going to say, uh, and I know this is maybe not the easiest thing to do right on the spot, but like, could you give me one or even two games that could, let's say, make my gi game more effective from the bottom position? To stay true to the point I'm making, I'm going to say no, because there is no one size fits all. There is no game. Okay. There's just playing the game of jujitsu with having, by having specific task focuses and specific objectives that focus on invariance. So whatever game you design, as long as it's geared towards invariance with a specific task focus that helps you create an intention and inform your attention, then you're doing the right thing. Now, game design is more nuanced. So when you get into the constraints led approach, there's some principles that we want to adhere to to make sure that we get the most reliable information source and we are keeping our 
you know, action fidelity high and all these other rules. But um, either way, just, you know, putting the gi on, again, playing jiu-jitsu in a live way and having an intention and nowhere to focus your attention will get you, will take you a long way. Because even guys who don't know anything about the approach, which I actually want to talk about one second, are going to have an effect by doing that. So, uh, so let me just say one more thing for you. Ask a question because I want to bring this up. I made the fucking horrible mistake last time when I said that you know John Danner must know about it because he uses her heuristics, and then I said that heuristics were invented by an ecological psychologist. So I made a huge mistake, by the way. So uh, John Danner is 100% IP. His whole model is based on. Uh, uh, optimization uh, through explicit instruction. Doesn't mean he doesn't use live practice though, don't get me wrong, but uh, he uses live practice to head in the direction of optimization that he thinks. Um, and heuristics were invented by an information processing uh, scientist, um, but the guy I was referring to is a guy named Gerd Geigerenzer, who was trying to create um, a type of heuristics that allowed people to create or make decisions in the face of uncertainty, and he called it ecological rationality. And Again, I made the mistake of thinking that he was an ecological psychologist and uh, he coined the term and I was wrong about that. And I was also wrong that John Dardenner uses heuristics because he must know something about the ecological approach. Now, heuristics can be an informational, informational constraint and can help uh, give us an intention and focus our attention, but they themselves are not di directly correlated with the ecological approach. So also, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, guys. I fucked up. How do you, what do you think of John Danaher's teething, teaching methodology? I mean, there was that thread that came up when he was talking about how they do very specific. It sounded like he was describing the constraint led approach, right? And obviously that kind of went viral. I, uh, I, I don't know how he runs his practices and I would love to see how he does it, but I assume he's showing techniques, you know, uh, and, and, and showing things that way. I've been to a few of his practices and he's definitely showing technique. He'll show a few movements. So have you go do them. Um, and then he'll come back in and show you another one, have him go do them. And then he'll do situational sparring and then he'll do live sparring, right? Or like a full rounds, right? Um, and the, the class- Very similar to what I would do. For, for sure, for sure. I mean, that's what most people are doing now, right? Because everyone's just copying John Danaher. So that's fine. Uh, you know, I mean, it's so it's so funny. I, every All these videos that pop up, I watch all these jiu-jitsu videos on, on Instagram. I kind of you know, judge people and criticize and shit. So I'm like, you know, looking at this stuff and everybody's saying like so. It's so funny. Like, holy shit, man. Like you guys are, you guys are so deep in the shit that you're even saying like, so fuck man. Jeez. You know, it's like, <laughs> I know <laughs> it's like, I feel like yeah. you ever watch, you never watched it. A lot of them say it. The movie, uh, the, the cartoon Shrek, uh, what the fuck the, the, the movie Shrek. It's like at the end of the movie when, uh, what about it? Well, it's just, uh, there's a scene in the, end of the movie where they're all running from like stuff that's burning down and they leave one Starbucks and go into another Starbucks. It's like, uh, that's everybody like with the John Danner approach. It's like they're running away from one thing. And they all just go to what John Danner is doing. And they all go to what John Danner is doing. Like, we know jujitsu. We're good coaches. We know what's going on. Like, so and they're just copying a great coach. And they're trying to say that they're great coaches too, because they're copying John Danner. But uh, no, I, I don't know exactly the depth of his method. So I wouldn't assume that I know it. Uh, but what I do know is that he has an optimized theory. So he basically thinks there are optimized movement solutions that a student should work towards to better their understanding, which is an information processing model. It's it's a it's a um, uh, it's uh, a representative model of behavior. It's not it's not direct perception. So again, uh, and in I, in your own words, in your own words, John Danaher is a great coach. Oh no, for sure, because that's not all John Danaher is. Just because he uses a information processing model to organize his practice. I don't know if he's organizing his whole practice like that, right? I do know some things about John Danaher that, I, I, first of all, heuristics are an informational constraint. So heuristics do help people make informed decisions in the face of uncertainty. So that's a, that's a good tactic that we can use to uh, attune our students' intention and attention. Uh, heuristics are great, right? So he uses those. He's very big on that, right? Um, his analytical model is very strong. So the slices that he chooses to define jujitsu in, I think are very well thought out. Right. I think they're they're beautiful. Now, again, they're arbitrary slices, but some of them are like spot on. I think I think they're just they're good. They explain what's happening. And he does lots of live work like and not only are they doing lots of live work, but it's a lot of good guys together doing live work. You know what I mean? And also John Danner is saying things to them to help increase their perceptive acuity, to help uh, try to inspire new action potentials. There's so much going on in his room to say that it's his information processing model is the one and all be all is that silly. 
This is an obvious answer. How do you know John Danaher is a good coach? Because of the results he creates. Like, right. I mean, listen, nobody describes what we do better than John Danaher, period. Okay? They don't. Like, even if he's wrong, even if he says something silly and kind of contradictory, which he does sometimes, it does not make his information bad. We all contradict ourselves when we're trying to understand something that, that some natural phenomena or something we're seeing, right? Um, but even even if, even in his if silly John, moments, yeah. Even in silly moments, he's saying good things. If John Danaher had, uh, you know, let's say, let's rewind it like 30 years or whatever when he was first getting back into, first getting into jiu-jitsu. If this guy became a coach and the only way he was teaching was ecological approach, would he be a better coach than he is today? <laughs> yes. His students would, listen, because of John Danaher's pull and because of how many people he has around him, talented people that are willing to work for him. If he, and again, I don't know if he's, I don't know what he's doing except what I've experienced. Okay. So, but I think that if he were to learn how to use this model of self-organization uh, based on direct perception, his students would be nearly unbeatable. They would have like the Penn state effect. Like his students are already, they, even, they would, they would be even more successful than you've seen like George St. Pierre or Gordon Ryan. Oh, oh, for sure. I, Cause I think uh, what we're experiencing with his students right now is the novelty effect. So the idea is that his information is so new and so sound and nobody else is doing it at the level that he's doing it, that his students have a massive advantage. Okay. Right. First of all, they're mm -hmm. using, they're using live training and John Danaher. We've seen that time and time again. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, and again, if I, if I wanted you to win a match, right. I could be, okay. I want you to practice this technique and I want you to really try it. And I gave you the whole answers and I said, go out there and no one's ever seen it. No matter what resistance they give you, you won't need to make it adaptable or flexible because it's very stable because it's in an environment that has never been exposed to. And so it's like, man, like Eddie Cummings, Eddie Cummings was rip ripping people's legs off from standard entanglement. He was just entering legs, straight hooking motherfuckers. Like it was nothing. They didn't know how to respond. So it really wasn't quote the effectiveness of heel hooks. It was the effectiveness of heel hooks in a novel situation. That's what we're, that's what we saw. Again, not that it wasn't a necessary part to add to the whole paradigm, the whole, the whole, the whole model. I think it was great. It got people to focus on those and the strong effects they do produce. But as you can see, um, they're mixing in well, and it's not only just a bunch of motherfuckers straight heel hooking each other. So Danaher probably didn't learn what he knows based on being taught through the ecological approach. Would you agree? No, I think he did. So everyone does. They just don't think they do. So think about, think about the silliness of that, of that statement. I mean, really not real way. Like check this out. How does somebody know something before they act to figure it out? The first someone has shown them who has figured it okay, out. Okay. So who's shown them? Probably Henzo. Well, who showed them? Probably his dad well, or his Well, who brothers. showed them? Again, dad or brothers. And who showed them? Uh, Mitsuyo Maeda. Now you're now now I really got to question my history. <laughs> no, you don't need to know history. What you're getting, you could go all the way up the line, right? Exactly. You're getting caught in what's called an infinite regress. The thing is, is you're you're that you're having a chicken or the egg problem, right? So we, mm -hmm. we can either solve the chicken or the egg problem. Behavior does not emerge from knowledge. Behavior emerges from intention. So the first person that ever intended to do anything created the first bit of knowledge. So the first human that ever thought legs might be vulnerable to breaking and grabbed a hold of it and twisted that motherfucker, that was the first guy to ever do it. Nobody taught him shit. He used his own action capacities in an environment and he tried to he perceive what he thought would produce whatever he was intending to do. And he came up with something. It emerged. And then he continued refining that emergent quality from whatever way he did. And then he tried to share it with people through explicit instruction. But right. And is that not effective? It's effective in the face of to no, some degree when there, yeah, when there's no other tool, it could at least, but, but it's doing the same thing. So explicit instruction is informing intention and attention, but what it's doing is it's informing it in too specific of a way. And it's that specificity. That's the problem. But uh, informing and pass, you know, you could call it like passing on knowledge or passing on techniques that someone before you had developed, right? That's why we see 
a lot of that I think is why we see athletes nowadays in different sports. They're so, so much higher level than they were decades ago at, even at such a younger age. Why is that happening? Because and there are more people playing. The, the, the most logical reason I can see is because, uh, because a lot of trial and error has been done with through the past generations. And now that information is getting passed on. So in a way it's kind of accelerating their, their ability and they know kind of it's, it's almost like they, they, they're skipping ahead steps in terms of trial and error. And they have the knowledge from a young, young age. Is that not correct? That's not correct. So there is a historical knowledge. Why would, why would, yeah, there is a historical Sorry. knowledge that, that happens, right? But this knowledge is not what you think it is. Okay. It's based on engagement. So you have more people doing a thing being or give, being given an opportunity to do the thing by people who have done the thing, right? So what's increased is the opportunity for more people to get involved and play or do the action or play the game. That is what creates that big skill that you're talking about. It's not what we tell ourselves. It's the opportunities we have to act. We have more opportunities, let's say with basketball, we have more opportunities for more people to interact playing the game of basketball now than we do in, in you know 1950. So that historical record comes with us, right? Rules get better. Equipment gets better. Uh, training protocols get better. Uh, more people playing gets better. Things become more competitive. That's what's happening. It's a relationship, man. It's, a, it's an ecological relationship. It's not explicit instruction that makes it happen. But in a situation like jujitsu or a sport like jujitsu where you know, new guards and new positions and even new submissions are constantly being, uh, I don't know if discovered is the word or utilized that were not used in previous generations. I mean, we're seeing like completely new systems that didn't really exist. Well, I'm not going to say they didn't exist, but I'm just going to say they weren't as commonly uh, observed in live situations. And, and now we're starting to see them and we're able to see kids do certain moves and certain techniques that right. where uh, adults who are like full on black belts didn't have the knowledge or the ability to do that before. Right. Because there's no correlation so, between that knowledge and your ability to do something. See what's happening is that first of all, it's more visible. So these children are seeing people perform action. And so what's very interesting about the ecological approach is that uh, to, in order to organize a movement solution, we have to pick up information and that information in the ecological language is called an, aff an affordance. And affordance is an opportunity for action that we perceive directly between our, us and the environment, right? But what also is really interesting about that is that we can perceive the affordances of others. So when I watch Matt do something and I watch you do it, I pick up the same information that you do. So if something looks reachable to you, I can see that it's reachable to you. If something looks graspable to you, I can see that it's graspable to you. But what's interesting is I don't have your same hand or your body dimensions. So it's a very mysterious thing. Like, how are we doing this? It's because information is direct and we're picking up the same information source relative to our task. And so little kids are able to do this a, a lot more often now because we have YouTube, we have big schools where people are performing jiu-jitsu and we have people there who already are good at it. So kids are seeing high level jiu-jitsu be performed right in front of them. So those affordances they're picking up are a little bit more sharp, a little bit more pure, a little bit more involved. You know what I mean? And so when given the opportunity to act and play, they pick up these affordances and they act upon them. It's a deep relationship, man. It's not explicit instruction. Kids don't mm -hmm. even listen to you. Like when you show, you gave the example of you showing kids long steps, bro, the best you did was just move in front of them. They didn't hear words you said. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, I have another question here. Uh, are you thinking about implementing differential learning? Yeah. I asked the person to define differential learning. They said differential learning is an academic theory that possess, uh, that possess, uh, that poses that we own, that we learn only through variation and therefore we should turn up the variation stop, all the way. Stop. That's wrong. Stop. Uh, they had speed skaters do things like pirouettes, no, start stop sitting down, etc. before doing a lap and found that their performance improved faster Stop. over the traditional training group. <laughs> that's not, that's not differential learning. Fuck. That's <laughs> the, hey, don't, don't get mad at I'm me. Mad, this I'm is not mad someone at you. else. Man. I'm not mad at you. Fuck. Look it up online, guys. Go look up differential learning for yourself and find the actual term. If you want to uh, look up research studies, uh, Wolfgang Schollhorn is the man right now. He's doing all these crazy studies with it. So check him out. Anyway, 
uh, differential learning is basically just adding more noise to the system to enhance the signal. So there's a relationship between noise and signal. And there's a phenomenon where as you increase the noise, you also increase the signal. And so, but if there's too much noise, there's no signal, right? Same thing, if there's not enough noise, there's no signal. So we can't differentiate. That's why it's called differential learning. It's the difference between the noise and the signal. So again, as you increase one, you increase the other. And so, um, so yes, I'm trying to use that now, but it's not that easy because um, I don't really know what to manipulate sometimes. I don't know what quality what within the task, what within the environment I should manipulate to create this differential effect, right? So what one, we actually have it in our school a little bit by accident. So our mats are like an ice skating rink. Drive does not exist on these mats, okay? So you have to organize in such a way that you have to engage without drive, without friction. And so this has created a unique effect. My students are very difficult to destabilize, like crazy difficult. You know what I mean? Like if you watch DeAndre, you can't move that motherfucker. Like he doesn't go anywhere, mm -hmm. even on these mats, dude, it's like his feet are glued to them. So, and, and in essence, that's noise. And so we have to pick up the signal for balance, for stability, and we have to do it under the slippery ass surface. However, I try to purposely use it uh, by uh, starting off in uh, what I would call randomized, nonsensical engagement. So let's say, for example, I want to organize people's attention around resolving hip connection. So I want them to get connected to the hip. I've been trying this thing where I start them at the end of the ankle and I tell them to put their feet anywhere. I'll be like, start with your feet like this. Like start with two of your feet over top of your opponent's head. Start with one foot behind their back and one foot facing the other direction. So I'm having them start in these like a randomized, uh, like nonsensical alignments. And I'm having them trying to resolve into something uh, to pick up the information, to find the hip and to attach to the hip. And so I, again, the, the Corbet brothers, they came to you black belts, right? They both came to me as black belts. And what was their what was their training like? First of all, do you know where they trained before? Oh, yeah. I'm sure you do. Yeah, so their original school was a school called Coastal BJJ in Virginia Beach. Okay. I assume the training must have been like a traditional approach. Yes. They're, so, and this is no offense to their, their original instructors are, are amazing. Okay. The, the, the character and habits and focus that these two boys bring to practice is unparalleled. They're, they're different. Okay. And that was heavily supported by their original coaches. Their original coaches instilled with them the habits of hard work, of effort, of focus. They're amazing coaches. However, they were largely technically untrained. They trained each other because they were so passionate about what they were doing. They put in so much effort to try to understand what was happening, but it was unguided largely. I mean, the technical aspect, I'm not talking about the, the effort, and you know, working hard that was all guided by his original coaches so okay this person is coming all the way from germany and saying i would like to know what greg thinks about showing people other people's solutions to problems they face in grappling as far as i see there is no difference between showing people a technique and let them work with it and adjust it to their own needs and capabilities and people copying behavior from people who are successfully winning the game against them or others. Yeah, I have unsupported beliefs and opinions too, man. Congratulations. But I do not uh, do not stop my students from searching. Okay, it's a necessary part of the learning process. So if my students want to watch other people do things and feel inspiration and try to copy these movements, I would never stop them from doing that. Like, I don't know what you guys think I'm fucking doing. Okay, I don't care. They can do whatever they want. But again, their learning comes from their practice. Okay. Again, we just attune the practice to what we know to be true about how people learn and develop skill. Okay. Um, do you think the classical approach, you know, things like, I don't want to say speed drills because I'm not a big fan of speed drills, but like, you know, light, let's, let's use like Toriando passing versus light resistance, getting reactions. Okay. Um, or even sequences where you use a Toriando to set up a leg drag, and then from there you go into a long step. Okay, this is something that like Tynan and Mendez Bros show in practice, and they get their they get their students to work this, and then they add light resistance and whatnot. Okay, for sure, for sure. Uh, do you think that that approach has any more validity when a gi is involved? Because the gi, um, 
the gi involved, I, I find it's just su such a, I do find it's a more complex game than no gi just because the amount of very variables that are involved and also because it requires use of small motor movements like my fingers, for example, trying to use my, my fingers in a live situation as a, like, I, I think in no gi, it's pretty easy to get a two on one on someone's wrist. It's not that hard. However, Shit. you got to grab, you got to grab like a, well, it is difficult against someone who's resisting very well, right? But right. I mean, like, I think it's more intricate to try to grab cloth as opposed to trying to grab limbs. And especially when the grips of cloth and the different variations of cloth grips, uh, they differ so greatly in the gi. So hmm. would you say that um, there's any more validity in the classical approach because the gi requires so much more variation than no there's, gi. And there's, that's my opinion. I'm not right, saying that you right, right. agree with that. That's there's my no association between gi and no gi in the ecological approach. There's none. The ecological approach can be applied to any human behavior. I'm just applying it to the no gi environment. Okay, so... I, right, I agree I, with that. Okay, so guys, stop asking me that fucking question. It has nothing to do with no gi. Jesus. You can use it for you know anything. What I think I think what would be so awesome, dude, and like I've, tr I've tried to get it out of you this episode. It doesn't look like I'm going to get it. Go I would love to see you release a couple of gi games because I want to see how you teach gi. Like there's, I, I there's the people. OK, but 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 you can't tell me that the games wouldn't also include like gripping details and things like but, that. Well, so let me come yeah. answer. So but I want to see that. I want to see you show that. And I'm sure there's people listening to this episode who have a hate on for Greg Souders who are like. They want to know how you teach gi. I get people asking me, hey, ask him how he would teach gi. Like, okay. even if I know, you could even say, hey, this is a fucking joke. The gi sucks. But here are a couple of games that I think could help you in the gi. Right. Like, people would love to see that. Great. So uh, just a small thing. So your 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 um, thing about the grips being more complex. So I just want to show you guys something real quick. When a hand grasps, you ready? Looks the same to me. So... They're different. No. Different. Look. Yes, different. It's way harder to grab. I think it's way harder to grab cloth, especially if your fingers are fucked up, versus grabbing uh, grabbing someone's limb. Okay? Maybe the limb is more slippery, yes, but in terms of grabbing cloth, it's a completely different feel. And for myself, being a nogi guy, like I'm not as in tune with grabbing cloth. So I actually think it's a completely different skill and I find it more difficult. I find grabbing cloth requires different muscles in the fingers than grabbing, uh, let's say, a two-on-one on someone's wrist. Yes, it's the same movement, but it is a different feel and I think acquiring a grip is, is a different skill for both situations. I, I agree that the information that you attune to is different, but the degenerate effect of a hand is the same. Okay. So and also... The, the strategy behind gi, like certain grips, for example, like let's say, let's say, um, you know, like why why doesn't a long step, why isn't it effective in no gi? Because, because we can't control the distance. It, yeah, you can't, you can't pull yourself in once Correct. you long step, right? Correct. So, um, so in th something like inside position, you know, like Gordon, Danaher, they're always talking about dominate the inside space. Yeah, yeah. If I, if you have your frames in front of me, Mm -hmm. And I'm in the split squat and I go to long step, there's no way I'm passing your guard. Like, I guess you're gonna bring your knees in, it's gonna be a fucking joke. The, you don't have to say all that. Just, right. We, we can't control the distance. But in the we gi, can't. but in the gi, even if you have frames on the inside, even if you have your hands there, it doesn't even really matter that much as long as I can get that grip on your collar, right? So the whole idea of inside position, I think, changes uh gi to no gi. Sure. Like there are certain things that change. We can't do the same thing. Um so that's like for reasons like that, I think it can be more difficult for a no gi guy to jump into a gi situation because I need to be trained where to grab to make certain techniques work in the gi that I'm not used to in no gi. Well, you have to do that for everything. So it's no different. You have to attune to specifying information no matter what you do. So the thing that you're attuning to will directly affect your level of attunement and the stability of the movement solution. Again, it's, co it's a constant truth that does never ch it does never change. So when the, when the cloth is on, we must consider it. It will affect the 
emergent quality of the behavior. When the cloth is off, it will have a, the same effect. It, it will it will affect the emergent quality of the behavior. So, but before you listed a bunch of reasons why it was more difficult for you. You said I don't have as much skill there. Um, uh, I feel like my fingers are messed up. These have nothing to do with the complexity of a thing. These are just limiting factors for you. But uh, what you mean to say is that when you grab a hold of cloth, there are more gripping options because I can grip in more yes. places than I can uh, with that level of control on a naked body. I'm in 100% agreement with you uh, on that fact, but it doesn't. And there's certain things that will work when the cloth is on as opposed to. Correct. Now, but there's also trade-offs too, right? So for example, because of the nature of gripping cloth, the geek game is slower. So there's less movement. So does that reduce the complexity? Maybe grip complexity increases, but maybe movement complexity decreases. So again, there's there's all yeah. these things that are happening at all the time. Like to try to parse out exactly what the difference are, it doesn't really fucking matter. Just choose which one you like and train it. But the idea is that the way that I teach people is by, again, informing their intention and attention through live practice. Okay. So as Josh Peacock says, unscripted and uncooperative practice is the beginning of live practice. And so as long as your practice is un uh, unscripted um, and uncooperative, it's good, or at least a beginning of good. Will you, will you do me a solid and make, make a video with a couple of gee games? We want to see it, man. As okay. Well, check, guys, it, we yeah, check it out. Check it out. Okay. On. It's fucking hilarious. So real quick though. My whole thing was, I wanted to teach you guys how to make these games. And again, I've got so much shit going on right now. I got the guys preparing for trials. Like I've been competing like a fucking crazy person. I've been, I've been doing so many calls and so many podcasts. I haven't had time to sit down and make any more videos. We've been working, we're working on something to give you guys. Okay. But what I, really, I hear you, what I really wanted you guys to know is that I gave you a heuristic. I gave you a way to look at it. I gave you a way to look at it, but it's like, nobody wants to hear that piece. It's the same reason why people miss John Danaher's good information. It's because that 20 minutes, that five minute speech is the best thing that he says, but they'll sit there and watch eight hours of methods like crazy people. They should, if you just listen to the first thing he said, he's giving you a good chunk of, of ways to think about jujitsu that's going to make you better at it. But either way, we play the game of mobilization as it leads to strangulation and breaking. We attack the periphery so we can gain access to center mass. We immobilize center mass so we can isolate and re-attack the periphery. The foundational engagement in all grappling situations are is that we make and maintain connection for the purpose of controlling distance through destabilization, isolation, segmentation, and immobilization. So you can use that to design practices no matter what you're wearing. So if we know that the first skill that we're working on is making, maintaining connection, create task focuses within live resistance games where you get to experience the effects that making and maintaining connection has on your opponent relative to their resistance. Again, and then use those connections to control distance through destabilizing or, you know, making them fall down or destructuring their limbs. You can use those connections to segment, meaning bypass what's in front of you going feet, knees, hips, or arms, knees, or excuse me, uh, hands, elbows, shoulders. We can use those connections to isolate limbs from everything else. And we can use all those connections to hold the body still as we strangle and break it. Like I've given you guys what you need, but everyone thinks that, mm -hmm. you know, they want to, they just want to copy. It's the whole reason why John Dano's copy. Now they want to fucking copy my games. <clears throat> yeah. I think, I think people and myself included just really want to see like your, uh, the way that you would teach the gi through games. Like I know you're giving, you're trying to teach people. You're basically, you're trying to teach people how to fish and, uh, they want fish. Yeah, so they can catch the fish themselves. Right. <laughs> yeah. They can develop their own, they can develop their own thing. But I think what I, you know, we really, what's interesting to me is like, what is Greg Souter's you know, and you're someone who is no stranger to the gi. You know how to do gi. You've done gi for years for sure. before you, you hung it up. And I want to see your, how you would structure games. And I think that would actually help me. It would give me a sense of direction as to how I could go and structure my own games. And I'm curious to see how you would do it as someone who, you know, is trying to rebuild their gi game. For sure. But, but, like but I know you're busy and I know it's probably the last thing on your mind is develop well, gi games for some Canadian guy. I literally, I literally <laughs> would have to have uh, AP send me a uniform because I don't have any gis left. I gave them all away. Um, but yeah, <laughs> really? you know, yeah, of course. I'm never putting that fucking thing back on again in my life. Like, oh my God. I'll message them and I'll say, hey, Greg, Greg says he'll do some videos in your gis if you send him <laughs> well, one. Come on, all, just send him a gi. <laughs> all of us are already sponsored by AP, so they send us stuff anyway. But I told him never send me a uniform because they asked me like, what's your uniform size? I'm like, come on, homie. You know I don't train with that shit. Um, 
But no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh, man. yeah. I mean, I again, I mean, I, I know we fucking we literally argued for an hour over the nature of moves versus fucking not moves, and I literally have a whole goddamn list of things here that we need to correct. We need. Yeah, to- yeah, yeah. I know. Do, do, do you want to keep? Do you want to keep talking about that, oh, or you gotta I, go? I, no. you, you probably got lots of stuff to do. I, no, all, I mean, no. I have. Uh, what was uh, Party Bear is going to give me a call at five o'clock. Uh, Ed Ingemels. If you have things, you, no. If you have things you want to go over and correct that we talked about last time, oh, feel free. The oh, floor is yours. Honestly, man, I just wanted to kind of you know the thing is is like you know I know what it's like to be trash when you're trying to understand something, right? I get trashed all the time. And honestly, I really don't give a fuck. The only frustrating part is neither do I. Yeah. Okay. Good. But uh, I actually like getting trashed because it means that people are leaving comments, which uh, gives me more uh, helps the algorithm. So. Well, the thing- All the guys that are going to be like, oh my God, Matt, I can't believe you're not on the on the eco train 100%. This is blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, okay. Just leave your comments and just you know, enjoy the show. Yeah. I mean, one, just one thing to defend some of those guys a little bit is the guys who are really well read or who are doing the work. Uh, they're doing a lot of work and they're going to great lengths and great troubles to understand a difficult science. And so when uh, you know anybody who could jumps on for one, three months, two months, one year of experience and they just start running their mouth, it almost feels offensive. It's like if a white belt came to your class and started trying to tell you how to do an arm lock. You'd be like, get the fuck out of here. You know what you're talking right. about. You know, it's kind of the same thing. But either way, I mean, of course. I, I would be like, who are you? There's no such thing as an arm lock. Right, exactly. See, you know, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I do is I just, hey, I was like, can you please define it for me? Can you please show me the conditions that need to be present for an arm lock to function? Can you please tell me the basic function of your connections? Can you please tell me the basic function of this alignment here? Nobody does. You know, that's how I stop people from just talking. I just show them that they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Some people keep talking anyway, but either way. Um, so no, I mean, we, we get, we get bullshit on either side, man. The people who like what I say, and people who don't like what I say, they're, they're equally ignorant sometimes. You know what I mean? The people sometimes support me blindly and have no idea what they're talking about. And the people who hate me blindly have no idea what they're talking about. It's very rare to have those people in the middle, you know, or those fence sitters that we really want. Um, but either way, uh, so what other, what other corrections did you want? <clears throat> did you want to have from the previous show? Oh, I just, well, there was actually quite a bit, but there's just a few things. So, uh, on, and when you were trying to describe the notes that I gave you when you were in Mexico, you said that, um, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, oh, uh, we can look at actions as having a continuous serial or discrete. And that's real, that's generally true. So if we want to like break down individualized actions and try to kind of, uh, say like what should take place here, because there are some alignments that only have maybe like a single action that is uh, obvious, like straightening an arm, for example, even though it's complex continuous because you're doing against resistance that is uh, unscripted, it's still like in, in essence can be defined as a discrete action. Uh, and some can be defined as serial, like extending an elbow and moving to the shoulders because those things are kind of coupled together. So we can't really get to the shoulders without moving the elbow out of the way. Uh, but again, it's still just all complex continuous. But if we want to like isolate certain movement patterns and try to discuss them in an analytical way, uh, that's why I told you that. So you could use that as a way to help analyze jujitsu to help better inform your practice. It's not because what? Because I the whole of jujitsu, the whole game is complex and continuous. It's not discrete or serial in any way. So it's a complex continuous game that's that's always interacting. And so I just want to clarify that, uh, in case anyone heard before. And then with that, you added in um, that uh, I have four pr- things, and one was uh, that. Um, I was probably uh, oh. half drunk no, and in the sun for a couple uh, hours when I wrote this down. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. That's uh, what I'm yeah. saying. Because I, I just, you just added in randomly structural destabilization. And I, I made a note like, how did that get into your notes? Because structural destabilization has nothing to do with uh, discrete serial or continuous tasks. So that just seemed a little odd. So, okay. Yeah, that's all. I just, just point that out. And then also, um, the, the, the part about Kazushi, I think this is one that's important too. So. I talk a lot about, about Kazushi because it's a, it's, a, it's a foundational principle for why things happen, uh, but it's not just mm-hmm. off-balancing. Kazushi refers to breaking apart a structure and then having those effects continuously occur. So again, it could mean like mm-hmm. falling down or it could mean disrupting structural integrity. So Kazushi is not just yeah. destabilization as we see it as like falling down. There's more to it than that. And so that's what I was telling you. That makes you. sense. And that's what I was telling you on the phone yep. and I got uh, a little bit uh, confused. Um, and then I guess only one more thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up about it. It's uh, when you said that my macro situations were vague, I was really confused what you mean by vague because there's something vague about being on your. Maybe computer. my understanding of it was pretty vague, is what it sounds like. Well, it's just that like it, it, macro just means the whole situation, so everything that happens on the feet. 
uh, everything that happens in guarded situations, everything that happens in pins. That's why I call them macro situations. We're taking into account the whole structure, not the component parts of the structure. So just when we're trying to determine where we're working from, it's easier we look at the big picture first, then we kind of shrink down into the specifics of any given engagement. I can just hear your your uh, your army right now. Oh my god, Matt's so fucking stupid. How can Stop. you even question this? No, no. Well, because I'm trying to learn too. Um, okay, cool. Is is that? Do you have other things that uh, you wanted to sort of correct from that previous conversation? Uh, or? Well, no. I mean, I honestly maybe we can talk in the future because there's some things I would like to discuss. So I really would like to get into the nuances of information, what that really means. I would definitely love to get into mm -hmm. the idea of. Uh, repetition without repetition in a real way, have a real discussion about it. Um, and then also discuss why a movement repetition has no value. Um, and so there's, these are some, some interesting topics that I think could really help inform people in a better way. And I, I thought we'd be able to- Like a it. solo drill. Hey, exactly. That why it has no value as it relates to skill, skill behavior, or skill transfer. Um, and there's- Wouldn't lot you need to define the word value though? Isn't that a vague word? Well, yeah. So what I mean by- Isn't that up to- well, isn't that up to perception? Well, only if we are not knowing what the what our purpose of practice is. So if we set an intention in practice and that intention is to uh, get transfer or take uh, what's happening in training and make sure it's applicable and usable in the performance environment, then solo drilling has no value because that does not. But what if, but what if, what if the student and the results both correlate to uh, success in, in the real situation based and using um using that said move is that just their perception well, and it's not actually well truth? it depends on what it depends on what else they're using you know what's really interesting about all the all everyone who, who talks about these solo drills and, and all these uh static drilling is they're not confident enough to train with only that see i'm confident enough to train that i train my students only with live resistance we don't do anything mm -hmm. scripted or cooperative or pre-planned or nothing is explicit here at my gym. And I'm not afraid to put that in front of everybody and put it to the test. Right. I did. I said this. Well, I think what I, I think what you're describing is like, you know, live resistance. Like it's kind of reminding me of like, uh, Randori versus Kata. Like, I don't think anyone is just doing, uh, non-resistance training, unless they're like Japanese jujitsu or something like well, that. Like, I think, I think everyone who's doing sort of static drilling or whatever is also incorporating some degree of live resistance or randori, right? Uh, may, maybe, right. I mean, maybe I don't know what everyone else is doing based on the quality of student that walks into my gym at every belt level, based on thousands of conversations that I've had over the last year, based on the stuff I see online, it's a fucking mess. It's a mess. No, like nobody bases what they're doing in practice on anything foundational or anything real. And, okay, and I say nobody loosely. I don't know. There may be five guys, six guys that are doing it. I don't know. But what I'm saying is everything that's being shown is, 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 a, is a fucking travesty you know, as it relates to understanding what we're actually doing. Right? There's an objective process here, and, and we are failing to see it you know? and as a community, I think. So, um, but no, I, I, um, we would have, to, so we would have to, to do that. We would have to hey, say, hey, we're going to do solo drills for three months. And see if it transfers to practice. And I guarantee it doesn't. You'll be worse at the end of that three, that three, that three months. But if I said, hey, we're well, not, I, we're not yeah. doing any more solo drilling. We're only doing practice. You'll be better at the end of three months. So why the hell would you add something in that had no notable or measurable improvement? Why would you waste that attention well, in that physical resource? Someone, someone disagree that it's not measurable. That's the thing. Well, no, I don't care if they have an opinion. I'm talking about it's already been measured. It's already been measured. You only want the opinions of the scientists who did the studies. Well, I don't want their opinions. I want the results of their study. I don't care what they think either. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah, I don't okay. give a fuck. Michael But wouldn't but what if so but but even results that could occur after incorporating these movements, even if the results are good, that's not that uh, correlation does not equal causation. Well, definitely not. I mean, because again, we'd have to take everything into account and that, that's, that's why the, the process is so rigorous. And that's why we need to sort of back what we do because we're going to fuck up all over the place. We're going to mess things up. We're going to do things that might not have an effect because we don't really know, but there are people that are trying to figure out what does, and they're getting closer to the answer than we are. So if we kind of attach our pedagogical processes to things that are known and things that are being worked out, then we can say with a little bit more certainty that these things that we do are going to have the effect that we're looking for. For, rather than, like I said in a previous podcast, just throwing shit at the wall. Like people love throwing shit at the wall because, you, like, 
because it's easy to excuse if it fails. Uh, and it's easy to insert any other practice into that space. If nothing is actually being tested or nothing's actually being argued for, you can never be wrong. And if you can never be wrong, you can say and do whatever you want. And so that's why people adhere to these, you know, anecdotal, experiential uh, experiences or me, ex these experiential outcomes. Cool. I got a couple quick questions for you, uh, just like kind of rapid fire type style questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to add um, in terms of like uh, things that you wanted to cover? I know I know you had other things that maybe we could save to another episode. Um, I, let me pull up my my because I have two sets of notes here because um, I took notes on um, specific things you said, but then also specific things that were unsaid. Um, so. Uh, only kind of really one thing. Some people, oh, one thing. People keep saying that like this has been around forever, right? So the theoretical framework for constraints was was conceived in 1986. It was 1986. So it wasn't even being used heavily uh, outside of like the developmental field. It didn't start getting put into uh, practice uh, for sport until like the 90s. So as, as science goes, uh, this discipline is relatively new. And it's in the face of traditionalism. So anytime you bring something new in the face of traditionalism, it's really hard to like kind of break that wall down and get people to see things in a new way. So again, everyone said, you know, this is, you know, old wine and new bottles. It's not really the case at all. It's just, we had to create language and find um, a way to describe what was actually happening so we could then start applying it. And that takes some time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What else? Got more notes? Uh, I got I'm sure the people want to hear, man. I got the floor is yours. Um, <laughs> I got a question yeah, for, for you. Yeah, for sure. And I might know the answer because yeah. I, I yeah. assume it's going to be ecological cool. approach. But how do you structure a comp class or does a competition class structure differ from how you would do a normal advanced class or all levels class? So there... To be honest, there is no such thing as comp class. Okay, that's a marketing ploy. So oh, they, Jesus Christ! I know, I know. Okay, I, I, let me let me get there. Every class is a comp class, bitch. It is. It's <laughs> truth, right? Because why are we training if we're not training to perform? Well, some people, you know, because I get a lot of recreational guys who are like, "Hey, this ecological approach is fucking so hard <laughs> yeah, for me," and is. I feel like I'm. You've heard it all before, right? Um, I had people asking me like, Hey, ask him, you know, how many, how many recreational guys have you lost using this approach? Because they feel that it caters more to, uh, competitors. But I, I think it just caters to improvement right. and skill acquisition. Exactly. That being said, do you not to some degree tell your, uh, competitors? Cause I assume, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm, yeah, not sure. everyone at your gym competes. Oh, right? no, not at all. I mean, the majority don't. Right. Right. So right. do you talk about things like points and match strategies and, and psychological warfare during the match and things like that? Uh, do you just talk to all of your students like that as if they are competitors and just it is what it is? Or do you specify some of your training or add certain aspects to training when it's time to get the Corbet brothers ready for like an ADCC yeah, yeah, or something? Sure. So and that's really what be the difference is the reason I have competition class on my schedule is to separate people. It's not because it's an actual thing. So my competitors train every day or every night during the week from seven to nine. Okay. They have that two hour block. Okay. We also train on Saturdays and Sundays. So six to seven days a week, my competitors train. Now I need to separate them from everybody else because they are held to standards and demands that I can't hold other people to. So there's an hour that they mm -hmm. get where they don't have to touch or look at regular people so they can really be who they are. Right. And so that's why I do that. But to create a competitor, they have to train like a competitor or what the demands of the competitive environment entail as often as possible for as long as possible throughout their time in the sport. Um, so, for example, like Penn State doesn't have a com competition class. Right. Fucking <laughs> they, they train to compete. So anyway, um, but the, either, either way, we, the way we talk about the thing here is we're developing skill. OK, so everybody in this room is trying to understand the physics present within the gap grappling engagement as it leads to immobilization, strangulation, breaking, or the resistance of it. And we are trying to teach people how to get better at this game, how to play the game of jujitsu. We are teaching people how to do that. So all of our classes 
are designed to teach people how to play the game more effectively and efficiently, right? Again, the only difference between a hobbyist, in my opinion, and a, and a, and a comp competitor is the hobbyist is not leaving this gym to use their skills. They're staying here to develop them. But the rigor is, is similar. But in terms of like playing the points or anything like that, you don't bother no, explaining we anything don't, like we that? We don't even do that with our competitors. I know a lot of people are like, oh, right, right, right. we don't do that. Okay, so we are trying to push the physics first. So we're trying to play the game as deeply as we can before we have to play the man. Okay, so we want to play the physical game of grappling. I don't want to play IBJJF rules. I don't want to play ADCC rules. I want to play the physics of grappling. Now, this does not mean that we don't put our students under the pressure of six minute rounds and eight minute rounds and 10 minute rounds because we do, but we try to let the way we see the physical engagement and it's idealized, optimized form, if we can say there is one, uh, to try to, as an ideal to search for. And again, the ideal is not specific, it's general. Again, the ideal is immobilization as it leads to strangulation and breaking or the resistance of that. And so we, we, we tailor all our classes to be as good as that as we can. And then we try to adapt that skill to as many rule sets as we can. Okay. Um, are you going to send students to the Nogi worlds? Uh, I've been, I've been actually debating that. So part of the issue for me is anyone under Brown belt can't heel hook. And so I was thinking about using the IBJJF as just a testing ground. Now to me, it's not a serious tournament because it's not full rules. So I don't care how many good people go there. If we can't use the whole expression of grappling, uh, minus a few dangerous things like jumping close guard, for example, or, or Kani Basami, which I, I think uh, jumping into submission should should be outlawed across the board. Um, you think it should be? Yeah, I think it should. I think jumping close guard and flying submission should be outlawed. Because Me too. they cause massive injury. And then they're very difficult to train because you don't want to you don't want to do that cost benefit analysis in the training room because you no. yeah, you just don't want to do that. So I think that because it's very difficult to train in a safe way, it, it should be taken out of competition. And that's just, you know, my soft ass opinion about that, but I think it should. Uh, anyway, I, I tend to agree as well. What about slamming out of submissions? You're into that? No, I mean, there's no reason, man, because the thing is, is if you have to, if you lost slamming out of submission, I'd be, I should be able to slam out of any hold, you know, because uh, that's what I would do. Like you think if it was allowed, I wouldn't grab you and spike you on your skull. I'd 100% do that. Right. But again, what, what's the risk? Why? I can win in other ways, mm -hmm. right? Isn't the gentle art? Aren't we trying to be as efficient, as yielding as we can be? Yeah. Anyway. So anyway, I mean, I do believe in the hard nosed competitive aspect, but again, flying shit and slamming people on their heads a little bit, a little bit over the top. How do you feel about advantages? So again, I think, the, the, again, we talked about this before. I think the way that we gamify the game or the rules we put behind it are very limiting and they're not, they're nonsensical to a large degree. I think that they're not geared towards progression. I think that our view of progressive action is just as far behind as our understanding of the sport itself. So I think that we haven't had a really good rule set yet. Like even this, this is really strange. So uh, an ADCC, right? Uh, if I shoot you, shoot on you, right? And then you drop down to turtle and you're there for three seconds, you can just lay on your back and then nothing happens. There's no score. So that's very interesting. So yeah. why is a turtle a reset? Why is it a reset? Like, isn't that progression? Don't yeah, you I want know. to see progression? Now, again, I don't know why they have it like that. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe they want to highlight the back take and they think that's going to be it. But if I know that all I have to wait three seconds to lay on my back, fucking right, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to lose in the last three minutes. I'll just let you fucking stay in side control and work on recovery, right? So- I don't know. I think it's strange. Mm -hmm. I think it's strange. I think we need to work on these rules. I think there's not enough there. There's nothing for reversals. There's nothing for go behinds. I, I don't know. It's just, there's, we need to yeah. need more. We need, it's not funny. We need more points. If we're going to play six minute games, we need more criteria for progression. If we're going to play six minute games. I may have asked you last time. I believe that, you know, the need to reestablish a guard before you get a sweep is pretty stupid. Don't you think As so? It's brutally stupid. It's brutally. It stupid. makes no sense. Yeah. Cause why? What about, um, there was another one I was going to ask you. Uh, I just had a brain fart. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, do you think ADCC should have cumulative points? So if you pass to mount, you get the score for both the pass and the mount, or should it just be the pass? Man, I don't know. You know, I do kind of like the low scoring criteria, even they don't have enough scoring options. So I kind of like that because it, it's harder to run away yeah, with a match. It's, yeah, exactly. It keeps things closer together. But I think that we should have little, like, like if I, if I am standing and I fucking snap you and go behind you, it should be one. 
at least. You know what I mean? If if you mount me and I recover my guard and stand up, why why am I rewarded for that? Right? So I don't know. That would make it more competitive. But again, having like big points, like if I go three, four, that's seven points. Man, that match is over. The match is fucking Basically, over. it's over. You have three minutes Unless left. there's like some kind of miracle. Dude, yeah, Noah got beat by this Atos guy uh, this weekend and like uh, last weekend and like the last, I don't know, like minute, right? The guy was being super cagey, backing up, pushing, backing up, pushing, backing up, pushing. Noah probably tr- do- dove under this dude and tried to make connections and destabilize this guy, I don't know, fucking 20 times. And he started becoming a little undisciplined and immature and literally shot himself with like open arms and the dude fucking pancaked him, just underhook, cross face, chest to chest and passed his guard. And then that was it. And so, um, yeah, man, sometimes, you know, the strength of a score will determine the end of a match much sooner than it should be ended. But if we keep those points a little closer together, we give everyone a fighting chance, even with a, a minor score. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Do you know about the... um? At least for ADCC opens, they have the invisible advantage rule. Do you know about this? I do not. If oh, you've gone to an sorry, buddy. if you've gone to an ADCC rules meeting, they would have likely have discussed this. I don't know if this is for trials or for world championships, but for for the opens, what they told me is if you make an initiation, you get an invisible yeah. advantage. They make marks on it, and at the end of the match. At the end of the match, if the scores are completely even and nothing is solved through overtime, they literally count who had more initiations. For sure. So let's say I shoot on you, you lock up a guillotine, and it's tight, and I got to roll out. I roll out, we stand back up. I get the advantage for the initiation. For sure. You don't get anything for the submission attack. Whereas an IBJJF, both uh, the takedown attempt and the submission are kind of worth the same in terms of advantages. Yeah. I think they're working out progression. They're trying to reward going forward. So if I go towards you, that that should be looked at as a good thing. But how do we do that in the face of a threat? Like, which is more important? The guy who went forward or the guy who added the threat? And so I think this is something that needs to be heavily considered. We need to play this out live and see what it looks like. Because again, we don't know. But we do want people moving forward. So I don't know. So I know you love the gi. Um, are you telling me that like you don't find any enjoyment watching Tyne and Dalpra or, or Miragali in the gi? No, man. See, you know, about these guys, they, they're amazing athletes. I think they're they're doing that thing, right? But like I said, I just, I just it's not what I want to see. I, I'm not interested in it anymore. It's just it's just slow. I just, I don't, I don't like it that much. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. Even though those guys are probably two of like the most dynamic gi grapplers, you still find that slow and boring. Eh? No, 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 no. I don't know. What they're doing is, is good. Okay. Cause they are progressing their positions. They're, they're, you're going aggressively at things or, I don't know. If you can give me an individual athletes and their ability to perform an action. Yeah, man, I'll watch them. I'll be interested, but it's the sport itself that I'm not interested in. Right? Like, so I love the idea of great athletes in football, for example, but I fucking don't want to watch football. I have no interest in it, but I think it's beautiful when someone makes an amazing play and shows this wonderful athleticism and does something cool. Right? So yeah, shit, I'll watch a highlight of a gi match, but I'm not going to sit there and watch the whole match because it's just uninteresting. And also too, right now, since the gi is sort of dying a little bit, man, Marigali and Dulpra are like, they're outclassing their opponents by a significant margin. And it's like when you watch Hoffa Mendez, that famous video back when he went to Japan and he was just <laughs> dancing on those motherfuckers. That was interesting. But again, it, it's a skill discrepancy that we're clapping for, not the gi itself. So, you know, but then you watch him and Gobrina, it's like they got stuck in 50, 50 for fucking ever. And they were trying to like tilt each other while stuck there. And they all, you know, whoever the last one to fall was like, ah, I don't know. It's all about who can stand up. Like, yeah. At the Nogi Worlds, I was telling you over text, I was like, yeah, we both pulled and he stood up first and he won by an advantage. And that's just how the fucking game is played, right? Yeah, man. I just, I, I, I wish we could find a way to just do it a little bit better, you know, to, to get some more criteria in there that actually looked like progression and was, was, was more objective and not just like what the table thought. Um, Cause that's frustrating, man. It's frustrating. Yeah. Who's the next president of the United States? <laughs> I told you earlier, man, when I was talking to you, fucking when politics happen, I close my eyes. It's one of the most like disgusting aspects of our, act, ugh, aspects of our existence. I can't stand it. There's nothing. Who's it going to be? Dude, whoever's the most fake and is going to do the most damage to our g- globe. I don't fucking know. Like, dude, all those dudes are trouble. 
Like, you know, it's funny about all these people who are running for anything. You wouldn't trust them with anything. If you hired one of those dudes as like your gardener, no. you'd put a camera outside to make sure he wasn't doing some crazy shit. Like, like the second you watch them open their mouths or hear what they have to say, you're like, oh shit, we're fucked. I mean, think about it, man. In all other professions, we have some criteria for how you get there, right? Like, I want to be a doctor. You have to show some type of uh, skill in that field. If I, you're like, I want to be a researcher, you have to do a research project to get into that field. To be a president, like, I, 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 one time I, you know, I ran the water system for New Jersey and, you know, uh, Jesus believes in me, so believe in me too. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And now what's even scarier is these motherfuckers are ancient. They're ancient. They're so old, they turn off while speaking. They'll be like, I believe oh, I in Earth. And you're like, and you're watching these poor, sad people have like strokes in front of you. <laughs> and then you're like, oh my God. You know what I mean? Uh, so I don't know, man. The whole st- I know what you mean, but what crazy. I don't. But what I don't know is who you think will be the next president of the United States. Bro, I don't care. We're, we're in a fucking, we're all polishing the brass on the Titanic, bro. We're going down. I, as long as, as long as I can show up to work, teach my guys and do jujitsu, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like I can't. So I assume you don't vote. You don't participate, right? I, I don't participate in anything. I try to stay as removed from the societal happenings as I can. Like I said, Greg comes out to watch his athletes compete and he goes back into his cave. Uh, and I, I have a little bit of presence on the internet now, but I almost don't wish I didn't. Uh, what makes a good coach? Oh man, a lot of things, but I think honestly, man, the willingness to, uh, do what it takes to get your athletes where they're going because that's your job. Right? So when someone comes to me, I'm saying, Hey, give me your money. I'm going to help you learn this thing that I teach. Um, and so it's very important that I'm able to do that and I'm able to do that well. Uh, and it should be informed by something greater than my own beliefs and opinions so that, you know, we can argue or change it if it doesn't work. So I got to know a coach's ability to really, that sounds silly, but do his job, to be informed by how to do his job, to treat his job like he's like he's a professional at his job, uh, which is helping students acquire skill. Mm-hmm. Do you foresee like a financial collapse in the next couple decades? Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about finance. I mean, shit's scary. Like I go to restaurants now, I'm like, here's a 15% sur- surcharge to help people with their mental health. I'm like, I pay taxes and you're taking this shit away from me then. And then I go to eat food and you're taking more away from me now. Like, babe, just, you've already increased your prices by 5%. I mean, interest rates are out the fucking gate. I can't fucking buy anything. Like, I don't know. I don't know what a financial collapse looks like or what causes it, but I'm a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so I don't, yeah. I don't know what any of that I shit is. I think we all are. Man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, man, it's just Do you think- wild. Do you think we'll see like a major conflict in the next couple of decades, like a war? Oh yeah, I mean, con- I mean, come on, like how, how many conflicts have we had in the last hundred years? I mean, you know, I mean, every every five years is a conflict. Every ten years there's a conflict, and they're always going on other places. Just the Americas have been lucky enough that the shit hasn't come to our continent, right? So, man, hopefully it doesn't for us. You know what I mean? <clears throat> if they draft you, will you go? It depends. You know what I mean? Depends if. They're on your soil, basically. Man, hold, if, man, if somebody invades our soil, I'm going to gun up. We're going out there to fucking remove these fools. You know what I mean? But I don't know how I feel about going there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. We've been doing yeah. that shit for a while, and it kind of feels a little bit wrong. I think we should stand our ground and stay here. And <clears> If they come here, then we fucking mercilessly destroy them. But kind of mm-hmm. stay here. 9-11, inside job <laughs> or exactly how they sell it? I <laughs> did. I, I honestly, I'm really curious about all these conspiracy theories. And the thing is, is when I say conspiracy theory, I understand that sometimes these things end up being true for us to believe that the things that happen to us are just, oh, the evil people don't like the Americans. And we're just sitting here doing nothing. They like, want our freedoms. They, yeah. <laughs> they want what we have, but they can't have it. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. Well, I don't know. Do you like, you know, in, in terms of that specific conspiracy theory, are you willing to give an opinion or no? I don't really have an opinion, man. Like I said, I mean, I, I can bullshit and fuck around with you if you want, but it's like, I don't know, dude. I mean, like, well, that's what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> that's what the people want. <laughs> yeah, man. Someone flew planes into buildings and fucking tried to disrupt something. And there was a lot of shit around it that wasn't good for a lot of people. So what the cause of it, what was the catalyst, who was involved, man, maybe only a few people in the world know. So, but again, I, we shouldn't, you know, wash our hands. Like, you know, we weren't involved in some way, I guess, because I'm pretty sure we were at yeah. some level. 
do you have uh, any hobbies outside of jujitsu or any activities you like to do? Nah, man. Like, honestly, like, you know, I just, I, I read a lot. You know what I mean? I try to stay up on the science as best I can. I listen to a lot of like, um, I listen to Rob Gray all the time. Anytime he's on, right? Anytime he makes a new podcast. I read, I read and I hang out. I don't really do much else, man. Like I mean, I'm here. Like, I got up this morning at six o'clock and just walked to the fucking gym. Like I sat here, I took a bunch of notes. I watched a few pot. I listened to a few podcasts. I watched a few jujitsu videos. I answered about 30 messages. I had two phone calls. Uh, a kid came in and interviewed me for a paper that he had at school. Uh, and now I'm talking to you. So this is pretty much what I do with my day. And then, you know, I'm going to train in about, man, I mean, two hours. Um, nah, man, this is, this is what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And you spar pretty well, I don't hard, you said hard last means, time, but right? I try to win every exchange. You go real hard in the room about what I win. So even if let's say I'm working on something small, like I really want to work on staying seated and make and maintain connections, I'm going to be very competitive with that. So it doesn't mean that I'm freaking out and running around the mat. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to engage. I'm trying to engage intelligently, but I'm also trying to be competitive about what I want to perform. Right. Because this is a fight, so I have to be competitive so that I can use the right amount of energy to solve the problem that's being presented to me based on the person who's standing in front of me. So if you consider that hard, then yeah. But again, I only have to move as hard as I have to. Do you let I your students put you into deep defensive them. cycles so you I can work there, your way out? I try to treat it like any or do other. You try and win every time. Right? So if a student, like let's say I, with a lighter student, and they mount me or something, and they say they, they they earn it, right? They get to my hips and they fucking mount me. I will treat it like any other position. I'll try to structure myself in an efficient way. I'll try to destabilize and create space and use that to be space to uh, put them back in front of my legs and get off my back. So again, I, I try to use the same level of focus of intention or not tension with everything that I do. And I try to use as much energy as I have to, but I don't give anything. Again, I believe in unscripted and uncooperative. I believe in that. So I, I preach, I do what I believe. Now, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll do constraints where I will literally have a situation where they start in a specific way. And I'll try to, I'll try to win the exchange. Like I'll have them start in arm locks and figure four grips and, and pins and certain grips, you know, and I'll try to orient my way back to a neutral position. But during yeah. training, you would never let your student like pass your guard and then work your way out of side control. DeAndre, Gavin. Do you have students Noah, that can submit man, you? Fucking, Noah submitted me twice, man. This motherfucker. So we were wrestling. Uh, and what did they get you with? Uh, he took my back off an underhook and just jumped and strangled me. It was super good. Uh, so Noah's has submitted me twice so far. Uh, he got me with a strangle one time. Uh, and then he heel hooked me two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, we were, bro, this fucking thing is wild. And it's still saying that I'm recording. I don't know. So I, it says it, it's showing me that I'm recording now. So oh, I think okay, we're, cool. I think it's okay. Awesome. We can just pick up where we left off. I think. Yes. Yeah, so you just asked me, uh, who submits me in the room? Yeah. Yeah. Who submits you at your gym? So, I mean, D, I mean, D fucking breaks me, bro. Like, man, he talks shit to me. Does he fuck you up on a regular basis? Oh, it's bad. It's so bad. <laughs> like, I, you know, when he first came here, right, it was like, it was funny. It was like three years ago. I used to tease him. I'd be like, oh, I thought you were a black belt, bro. I used to fuck with him. I'm like, yeah, I'm fast too. And I, it was, it was not difficult by any means. Now, it's insane. Like, oftentimes I get put on my back and I can't, fu I can't fucking get off my back. Like, and I'm like, I'm trying hard as shit. You know what I mean? Um, like I, I joke, I probably score on him. If we, let's say we trained in a week and we did like six, 10 minute rounds a day, I would probably score on him a handful of times throughout the week. And by score, I literally mean something simple, like put him on his butt or take his back. Cause the only thing that I can still reliably do to him is I can put him on his butt sometimes and I can take his back sometimes. Uh, those are two. Do you mean from a sweeping position yeah, yeah. or a standing from, from position? bottom position? I never, I rarely ever, I, I passing his guard is very difficult. Um, so, uh, I rarely take his back from top position if I, if I ever do. Um, but it's mostly from going. So I have a decent skill of going underneath. So I'm, I'm pretty decent at going underneath you and ex getting back exposure by going under. Um, and so that's a, like a kiss of the dragon yeah, type yeah, thing. For sure. For sure. And so I have this whole, this whole series of events that I can do from there that I'm pretty good at. So that's the only thing that I can reliably do left and I can put him on his butt. And sometimes we have some good exchanges, but largely he fucks me up. Like typically how our rounds go is like six minutes of nothing. We're just battling over something. And then, uh, he just, he overwhelms me and I end up getting, getting either passed, back taken, submitted, whatever. 
Yeah, DeAndre is DeAndre's a- How much bigger are you than than him? So typically I'm 20 pounds heavier, maybe 15 pounds heavier when he's full when he's fully fed. Right now I'm I'm 30 pounds bigger than him because he's light right now. But um, I'm I'm 185. I'm I fluctuate between 180 and 185. Um, and he usually hovers around 167, 170. Um, so that's kind of thing. But also D is massively strong. Like if you like, I came in here one day and this motherfucker's repping out 335 on it on his squat like it wasn't anything. Like you know what I mean? Like the dude front squats double body weight. He's so strong. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's good. Okay. Um. <laughs> Do you have a kids program yet? I think I asked you last time. No, nah, man, I had one a lot. I had one when I first opened, so I had your traditional school gi, no gi kids. And we, I, I think our peak, we had like 35, 40 kids, something like that. Um, and then when COVID happened, I just decided I really didn't want to get back involved with that part of the culture. It just it wasn't something I wanted to pursue because it's only me. I don't have any help here. I'm teaching all my classes and doing everything. Uh, so I decided to ax that. I really wanted to be able to focus all my attention on on my adult students. That's That's what I wanted to do. So that's what I did. Do you see yourself maybe in the future uh, incorporating kids, not just as a way to um, generate revenue, but like as you have kids, it kind of becomes almost a perpetual system that feeds into itself. So eventually you'll have high level kids that move into the adult program or high level kids that want to start teaching the young kids and things like that. But of course, you were talking like over five to 10 years, right? So is that something that you think you'll undergo or you just prefer it this way? No, you know. Based on how I see my future unfolding, um, I might have people who are going to pres- like come after me uh, to teach at my school after me and take take over my program. They might do it, but I'm not going to do it. Um, I would like to de- develop a teens program, like an early teens program, like 12, 13, 14 years old, because I think like that's the age, right? Get a, get a student at that age. That's better than getting them earlier, uh, just because they're closer to their adult bodies. Uh, and also they can, they can be serious in a way that kids aren't. Uh, if they choose to be here, which is critical. But anyway, I, I would like to start at that level if I could. But no, I mean we have we have teens here now. You know, Noah came to us when he was 15 years old, and he, that motherfucker yeah. is crazy good. Do you have ladies' classes? We don't isolate like sexes. Like everyone trains at everybody. You don't discriminate. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it discrimination. How how, uh, how non-inclusive of you? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean like the thing is though is like we 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 uh the we have kind of two different chunks of lady here. We have like ladies that roughly hover around 115 to 130 and ladies that are like 140 to 160. Um, and so they mix in with the, the smaller ladies, with the smaller men, or they work exclusively with each other, or we have the larger ladies working with the middle sized men. Uh, but really the, the, the women training with women is fantastic just because they're going to go at a level on each other that <laughs> some guys reserve and they don't. So I don't know. I think the culture is good to have ladies train with each other, but I don't like to isolate them into their own special class because there no, they're, there's nothing different about them as students, really. Mm-hmm. Did we go to the moon? <laughs> I hope so. You know what my? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's all a lie. Yeah, yeah. No, my one of my favorite scientists. Uh, I, I have two that I read. I read all their shit, like Richard Feynman and uh, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan says we did, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. So you believe that? I just, I'd say I'm just fucking around. I just love Carl Sagan, so. What about in the shower? Do you rip big pisses in the shower or are you against that? Dude, you got to piss in the shower, man. What the fuck? Conserve your water, bro. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. Oh, man. I mean, I don't really have much more for you, man. This episode is already like two. It's almost going, bro, it's going on three hours now. Nobody's going to listen to this shit. They're going to fucking hate on both of us. Both of us are getting fucked after this episode. I disagree. I think people will listen to this shit. And I also agree. People will definitely hate on both of us. <laughs> Me for being ignorant and you for not liking the geek. Yeah. Well, no, I'm going to get hated on because, right. hey, bro, it's just situational sparring. You know what you're talking about. Your fucking opinion means nothing. How many world champions do you have? Blah, 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 blah. It's just so pathetic. It's like you haven't done anything. So congratulations. <laughs> like you're awesome. Who's the best jujitsu coach in the world right now? Is it Greg Souders? <laughs> nah, man, I got a lot of work to do. Uh, there's a lot of things I have to prove about what level I am. Um, I don't, I don't know what level I am. And I, I just tell you that I'm, I'm doing everything I can to be the best coach I can be. And, uh, so far the students that I produce are very good from your average hobbyist to Deandre Corbe, uh, and all in between. I mean, why would you, just, just something to consider? Why would Deandre and Gavin, they're physical freaks. They're athletic. They're hardworking. These kids are amazing. They could do, they could do good anywhere. Why did they change their lives to come here? Right to a rinky dink nowhere fucking gym in Rockville. So 
I don't know. I don't know what that means. Who would you say is the best coach in the world? From your best guess. I'm only going to go with results, man. The person currently that produces the best jujitsu students on the planet is John Danaher. Regardless of everything, I mean, you have to, yeah. there's a lot to consider. But what he's been able to do in the last 10 years, and then the effect he's had previously when people didn't know who he was, was very strong. Clearly, he's a knowledgeable, intelligent man who knows what the hell is going on and knows what he's doing. So whatever he's doing, he's doing a good job. How do you feel about the, you know, the the things that uh, people like Robert Deagle and, and other people have said <laughs> about John Danaher being like abusive and they're all like, yeah, yeah, I saw that and slapping his UKs and pulling hair and things like that. Guys, here's my advice for you. May you never meet your hero, okay? The amount of psychopathy and sociopathy present in this fucking community is bonkers. The things that I've seen famous people that every single one of you know do would shock you. I've watched famous coaches snap their students' ACLs, strangle them unconscious repeatedly until they threw up blood, okay? So I've seen people do horrible things to each other. And these people that I've seen do this are regarded as saints and as gurus and as, oh, they would never do something like that. I've seen coaches start punching their students in the middle of an exchange. Like, get out of here. Like, the thing is, man, is the problem is, we, that's what Ryan Hall wrote about when he talked about the open letter to jiu-jitsu. We have to stop elevating regular people into guru status. See, the thing is, just about myself personally, I'm not trying to be on a soapbox here, but I'm fucking going to. I'm a regular dude. The reason I curse and act like a fool and contradict myself and act like a fucking asshole is because that's who I am. Who I am on a camera right now is who I am. So you'll never get a different Greg. This is Greg all the time. All right. And so I want you to know that. So I'm just a fucking guy who likes jujitsu. No guru status for me. But those of you guys who try to hold John Danner, I guarantee that motherfucker's got skeletons in his closet. All right. <laughs> to, to whatever degree. I don't know anything about the man uh, uh, as it relates to that. But again, you're foolish just to think that because he's an intelligent jitsu player, that he's anything other than just that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think there's, especially in jiu-jitsu, when you're dealing with individuals who are in positions of power, and especially if you come into a gym and you're, you don't, you're like a white belt, like you look at these black belts and you're like, oh my God, like this guy's, this guy's so much more knowledgeable than me in jiu-jitsu. And so you, you know, they have this like position of power and I think it's very easy to get wrapped up in kind of a cult personality where now these guys can do fucking anything and no one checks them. So I'm, I'm putting myself in the, in, in the blue basement as a fly on the wall during these times where, you know, he supposedly was like punching people and pulling hair and things like that. And, and no one's doing anything. And you're like, why, why isn't anyone doing anything? It's gotta be because there's almost like a cult of following around him, or maybe everyone just respects his knowledge so much that they just, accept that that's kind of how it is yeah and I, that, that's pretty pathetic to but, me it's like why are you gonna let another human treat you like that like it's fucking crazy you know what i mean but either way i don't know if it happened i'm just saying like yeah. why would you do that you know i mean the thing is, is like it is as as a as a controlling and as kind of like maybe people have a lot of opinions about me but the one truth is i believe in indifference i truly don't give a fuck so like and i think it's important because i feel like i'm immune to doing that because i don't care like if a student comes in and starts giving me too much respect for no reason, I'll make sure that they don't, you know, I'll make sure they see some part of me that <laughs> nice. they don't like. No, because it's real. Like I hate that. There's nothing worse than someone come up to you and giving you respect that you have not earned. You know, like people come yeah. like, Oh, 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 professor. I'm like, stop. My name's Greg. What's your name? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or sometimes I'll ignore yeah. you. Like people will walk up to me and I'm like, what man, I'm doing something. Leave me alone. You know what I mean? Because like, again, I'm just a guy and all these motherfuckers out here are just guys. Okay. Don't, don't let it fool you. Don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. Well, thanks for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. I, I hope that we maybe illuminated some of the darkness, right? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe you did. And maybe, uh, maybe you've even angered more people and maybe <laughs> I have too, but that's all part of it. You know, especially when you, when the, I always tell some of my kids who are, who are becoming pretty successful in competition, I'm like, you know, the better you get and the more you win, the more people notice you and the more they start to talk shit about you. Yeah, for and sure. especially when you're like trying to start a podcast or whatever, or you're trying to do a, you're trying to break a norm, like do a, a, a style of jujitsu that isn't as common in terms of teaching. Um, you're going to get tons of criticism. Everyone's an expert. Everyone has an opinion that is, you know, anyone can leave an opinion. And, uh, I just think it's funny 
when people think that they either know everything or that they, you know, they have a leg to stand on in terms of criticism. But at the same time, like you said, they've never accomplished anything. They're just happy to sit behind their keyboard and, and comment. Right. And the world's just full of those people now, especially with all the ways that we can interact with each other. So I don't know. I kind of enjoy it. I, I, I it's, it's kind of entertaining yeah. to me. Maybe, yeah, maybe no, that's not a good thing. No, I think but. it is a good thing. And I think really we have to treat it like that because if we are trying to be, be if we are trying to be serious, in any way that we attempt to be serious, then we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to get in the fucking dirt and throw mud like everybody else. But the truth is, it just really doesn't matter, right? Because they are not engaging with the same level of rigor that some of us are, right? So like, again, the amount of work that I put into trying to understand this and the, the due diligence I've done by talking to subject matter experts and scientists to try to make sure that I'm staying as ecologically sound as possible, I've done a lot, okay? So uh, again, these people are just, they're, they're going off their feelings and beliefs, man. They have they have no attachment to reality. Okay. So their opinion is literally meaningless, meaningless. Are you a free, are you a free speech absolutist? Oh, oh dude, what do you mean? Like, do you believe that anyone should be able to have an opinion in a public setting and share that opinion regardless of how uh, vile it may be? Sure. Like, do you believe in the you know, uh, First Amendment? I actually think it's important to let people be as vile as they are and let them do that because that's how we know our enemies from our friends. Like if we start demanding people be too yeah. safe with their speech, we don't know who the fucking enemies are. We're creating a safe haven for the worst of us, right? So if, if you, let the, if you let the racist be racist, then you know who that guy is. Stay away from that motherfucker, right? You know, if you know. You just, yeah, they've exposed themselves. Yeah, let them. Let them expose themselves, man. I th- but, you know, and again, uh, yeah, I, yeah, there's a danger to letting them hide. You got to let them come out in the open. Uh, so, yeah, say anything, man. Plus, exactly. Let people just be who they are. And then, you you know, if if it's, if it's somebody who's, you know, advocating for something as egregious as like uh, child trafficking or something, it's like, oh, I know that person. They've now outed themselves. Like, how is that a bad thing? Right. It's not. Yes. Yeah, right. Cause, dude, <laughs> can you imagine somebody saying that out loud? They would be socially crucified. Like, good God. Exactly. Yeah, let them say it. Come on, man. Let's let's we know who you are, you know? No, I god damn, I completely agree. I hate that, man. I don't like safe spaces. I don't believe there are any. Your safe space, the home you purchased, uh, you get in that thing, you lock the doors and you, you know, have all the feelings you want. But when you come out to the public square, your opinion has just as much weight as somebody else's. Uh if it's just an opinion, right? So again, we have ways to elevate mm-hmm. the opinions we have. Again, it's not by protecting speech or, uh, excuse me, specific speech. I know you talk about like disconnecting from the outside world and disconnecting from like politics and things like that. But do you believe that there's kind of a, like a shift in the culture right now where it's kind of moving away from this really hyper progressive sort of woke culture that we've had for the last 10 or so years. And now it's kind of moving more. I'm not going to say to the right because I believe the left and right wing is kind of bullshit, but like do you, it's becoming more like people, you know, it, they don't really care if they're getting criticized online or whatever as much because they, they just think it's all a bunch of fucking bullshit. Whereas like five, 10 years ago, you know, if you call someone a name online, like a racist, they'd be like, Oh my God, no, I'm not. I swear. I, I swear. I'm not that. Like, how can I prove that I'm not hateful? I swear. And now they're just like, just shut the fuck up. Like, I don't even want to hear that shit anymore. You know what I mean? Do you think that there's a kind of a shift going on right now? Well, I think the, the social swing, it, it affects each other. Like if we go in one direction, we're fucking coming back in another. That's kind of like the American culture anyway, right? We're, we're kind of extremists. You know, we're rebel extremists who like to swing in two different directions. They'll go hard in this way, go hard that way. And we keep going back and forth, right? We have this like conflict built into our culture and we love it. So if we go really far left, we're definitely going back the other way. So I don't know, man. I actually, I see something else going on. Uh, first of all, uh, we're so distracted and consumed with ourselves that we're not interacting with each other anymore. And that has massive consequences. So the things that we say to each other is constrained by not being punched in the middle of your face. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> I check people on a regular basis in my, in my waking life. Like I actually, people who hang out with me are like, coach, you got to chill. I'm like, nah, man, like, come on. People need to know they're fucking up. You know what I mean? Cause people should count talk to me, say something to me when I'm fucking up. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter that my opinion is unsavory or their opinion is unsavory. We need to face each other face to face and be able to say what we have to say to one another. Otherwise, man, the shit's going to get real bad. But yeah, man, everyone is just so disconnected. Nobody's engaging anymore. There's no more experts. Everyone knows everything. Like there's no consequences, but there are consequences for everything. It's crazy. The, the, I don't know. I don't know what this means, but again, we're losing that, that human human yeah. connection. We're having these weird 
weird things come out of it. And how do we get that human connection back? You know what I mean? Like Solar when you go flare. to the jujitsu gym, it's like <laughs> we're all connected through jujitsu, right? We're, so it, it, people with different ideologies and different affiliations and different backgrounds can come together and, and we kind of have that respect for each other through jujitsu. But aside from that, you know, like you're sparring with someone who you were best friends with for like 20 years online. And then all of a sudden they don't want to fucking talk to you anymore. Like, how can we, how can we as a culture kind of change what has, uh, how can we undo what has been done over the last couple of years where there's so much division? You're asking the wrong person, brother. I don't fucking know. Like I did the other thing. I just went away, went away from the crowd. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, like I joked a second ago, a solar flare, like, you know, like get rid of you know, an EMP pulse to get rid of all our technologies. We're forced to walk outside and actually be humans again. I, I don't fucking know, man. Uh, it seems like, you know, we're encasing ourselves. Well, some. I think something that actually along those lines could could uh, unite people, and it's kind of a scary thought, but war, you know, having like a common enemy where everyone now agrees, oh, that's the bad guy? Okay, and all the fucking mindless people just turn their direction towards, you know, after 9-11, it was, it was Muslims and Iraqis and stuff, and everyone just went in, okay, we're going to go in, right? And it's like, I think having, and that's what scares me is there's a need for unification right now. And that would be one way, you know, if we all have a common enemy, then that could unite everyone, but at what cost, right? And for kind sure. of scary to think about, think about what could happen in the future. If you look, if you look through history, there's always conflict. There's always another war. Maybe it takes 50, 100 years, 150 years. Eventually, there's always a conflict. And I feel like, you know, we were talking about dark forces earlier in the episode um, at play, and we don't know what they're capable of. But uh, a lot of the things that happen and play out in history, I don't think are necessarily as they as they seem. So I'm always I'm always kind of just like thinking about the future and uh Prep, preparing for some degree and trying trying to just be aware of, of, of where things can go, right? You know, I think we make it more nuanced than it actually is. I mean, there's a documentary on Netflix. Uh, it's called like Chimp Nation. So if you watch Chimp Nation, you'll you, that's exactly what's happening to us, okay? Uh, the bigger group always takes what they want from the smaller group. And there's always conflict over that. It's always the same. So Again, I don't know, you know, we've conflated our existence to mean more than it means, right? We're just an upright ape who can uh, abstract into the future and we're fighting over our own creation. It's just a silly, silly thing. So again, I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what forces are at play, but all I do know, it's always the same thing. The powerful smash down the people who are not, and there are serious consequences for it. And I think in our case, even though uh, the, the bottom is the many, Again, like you said, there's no unifying factor for the bottom. The bottom is so dispersed and so disenfranchised and disconnected that even if we had a common enemy to connect over, I don't think we will because, you know, we're just happy staring into our black mirrors, you know. Definitely. Do you think we came from apes? <laughs> what do you mean do I think we came from apes? We are apes. How? What do you mean? We're primates. Do you think do you think that we evolved from apes? We evolved from a common ancestor. We we are cl we're classified as apes. We are a specific type. So we're primates. That's, that's what we are. You, okay. So you're more on the evolution side as opposed to a creationist side. There there is no creationist side, man. They, you just answered. Yeah, I mean, there's there's only there's only been one viable explanation, <laughs> and the viable explanation is natural selection. So I mean that's that was the mechanism that separates things, right? So things respond to being fit in their environment as it relates to how they reproduce. You know, if they're fit enough to reproduce and spread their genes and things change when that happens and those pressures are present in the environment. So whatever that means, uh, we're part of that process, just like everything else on this planet is part of that process. So again, our ancestors, our, our, our cousins are the primates, all the other primates on earth. We're, the, we're literally the same thing, literally the same thing. Like the difference between us and a chimp is like one, I take one percent. I take it you don't believe in like a God or a higher power? Well, what I believe is in, inconsequential because my beliefs don't change reality. So when someone asks the question, do you believe in a God? They're not really asking me 
a question because again, my belief has no effect on that. And what I believe in any given direction, again, is not a reflection of reality. It's a reflection of what I wish reality to be, or I want reality to be. I don't know what reality is. I don't have access to the God figure or the God type as it's defined. And even as it is defined, I don't know if any of those definitions match how I feel about the subject. So I, again, that question is so nebulous. I don't know what we I mean. One God, many gods, no gods, the type of God that has we have no access to. I mean, what do we really mean? You have a very good way of not answering if you believe in God or no, not. No, but but I am answering it. See, the thing is, is people will say something like belief and don't think that word has consequences. That that word belief has an attachment to it. You're asking me, do I believe something exists? And what I'm telling you is I, I don't understand the question because I don't. What does that have to do with reality? Like, what, like what, if I said I believe in God, what am I actually saying? I would then have to define See, what I that think, is. I think, I think your explanation does uh, answer it to some degree without saying yes or no. Well, I can't say yes or no because it's not a yes or no question. Like, in a simple sense, well, any, it could every be question. your opinion. It could be your. It could be you know. It could be your opinion. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily reality. I think that's where some people, okay. you know, the religious folk where they have like faith, right? It's like, it's not necessarily a reality that we can measure if God exists, but we can believe there to be a God or gods or an energy. Well, okay. So without being able to prove I'll, it, I'll try to answer it based on what you just asked. Um, none of the explanations for the thing that we call or claim to be God are convincing to me. Fair. And I mean, like I said, like sweet people will say things like faith, like what, the f what does that, what does that mean too? So uh, people love to use words and they want it to mean what they want it to mean. And nobody wants to agree upon terms. We just want to say things and then we want to attach all these feelings to it and throw it around like it's ours to own. But again, if we want to really uncover what we're really trying to say to one another, we have to agree on terms. And again, faith is just, you know, it's kind of an empty reason to do anything. Last question. Steroids in jujitsu. <laughs> How do you feel about it? Ah, oh, man, that's a good question. I actually don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not for or against it, really. I know, again, it sounds like another non-answer, but the thing is, is to me, it's like, uh, are we all going to have access to them? Uh, is it a way that we, are we going to know how to utilize them in such a way to enhance our performance without degradating our, our everything else that they're associated with? I would, you know, if steroids were a way to enhance performance to allow the athlete to train more, I think it could be used in a constructive way if we had some way to control and manage it and give it access to everybody, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know. Again, sh should I be hiding in the back room, fucking juicing myself to the fucking gills to win a match and lying to everyone that I'm not doing it? Um, I mean, if people are using steroids, I would like them to be honest about it and say, hey, yeah, man, I, get, I get this huge advantage because, man, I can recover fast as fuck. I can, I can train four times a day and feel fresh when I wake up in the morning. Um, and I got biggest shit from like all these muscles I got, you know, all these, all the juice. So I think if it is used, people should be honest. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I really appreciate <laughs> your time. Is there anything you want to say or anything you want to plug before you get out of here? Nah, man. Oh, yeah, actually, I do want to plug this thing. Guys, we're recruiting. Okay. We're trying, we're fucking serious, man. We have a serious gym. We're trying to reach serious goals. If anyone gets this far into this episode and you have any hopes of leaving where you live and going somewhere to train because you are serious, consider us. At least come visit us for a week or a month and see if you like the way we do things. You train for free. You don't ever have to pay me. You just have to be serious. So again, if, if you're hearing me say this to you and this is something that you might want to do, again, don't just you know jump on the bandwagon, go where they say the best coaches are. Come experience what we have to offer. And uh, I would like to be your coach if you are that guy. So, or lady. What is it? Define what you mean by a serious athlete. Somebody who wants to reach some uh, a competitive height. Somebody who wants to commit to getting as good as they can and play the sport at a competitive level. How many like uh, your your competitors like the Corbey brothers and uh, Noah, like, uh, and others that I might not even know about. Do you, um, do they train multiple times a day? Do you have that expectation of them? No. What's the expectation? Dude, shit. All my guys have regular jobs, so it's a little bit tough. So a lot of the guys do their physical training in the morning before their regular jobs. They go do their regular jobs and they come here at night. We do a two hour practice at night, Monday through Thursday, seven to nine. Friday night, we have open mat six to eight. The crew comes through and gets their regular rounds in. Saturday morning, we have comp team uh, 10 to 11, and then we have open mat 11 to one. And then we have an eight o'clock uh, training session on Sundays that is closed 
uh, you can only come to that if I work with you personally. So um, the competitors come, the, some of the competitors come to that. <clears throat> Sweet. Anything else? Nah, bro. I think we fucking solved all the world's problems. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, guys, yeah, definitely check out uh, Greg's uh, Instagram and, of course, Standard Jiu Jitsu on Instagram. Check out YouTube because he puts out some pretty cool stuff. I really like the classes that you've been showing. Like, you, you're showing a couple foundations classes. I know those videos are not easy, they're a lot of fucking work and they take a lot of dedication. So, it's awesome that you're putting those out there. And sort of spreading um, your method. I know it's not your method, but the the ecological approach to other people. And again, I just want to say uh, that I really like the approach. I'm more of the. I'm not going to say I'm a traditionalist, but I do see value in other training methodologies. And um, I think it's all about balance. And at the same time, I know that I don't know everything. And uh, I can't wait for the comments to come in. <laughs> but uh, that being said, guys, if you want to like, <laughs> like, share, subscribe to the channel, leave hateful comments. It really helps me. Even if you're criticizing me, I will uh, not lose sleep over it, but I will laugh and I might I might even respond. Also, um, if you want to support the show or contact the show, there's links in the bottom. Other than that, man, Greg, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for being on the show and giving me your time. Yeah, dude, thank you, man. I appreciate you sitting this three hours with me and just fucking running our mouths, man. It's always fun. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine, dude. Thank you for your time. All right, brother. All right, take care, guys. Bye.